anything from this story. If I could just uh, make a couple of comments about uh, Joe Rogan. So I've, there's a bunch of people in my life who have inspired me, who have taught me a lot, who uh, I even look up to. The Many of them are alive, most of them are dead. I, I, I wanna say that, uh, so Joe said a few critical words about the conversation with Francis Collins, most of it offline, with a, with a lot of great <laughs> conversations about it. Uh, some he said publicly and um, he was also critical to say that me asking hard questions in an interview is not my strong suit. And I, I really want to kind of respond to that, uh, which I did privately as well, but publicly to say that uh, Joe is 100% right on that. But that doesn't mean that always has to be the case. And that is definitely something I wanna work on because most of the conversations I have, I wanna see the, the beautiful ideas in people's minds. But there's some times where you have to ask the hard questions to bring out the, the beautiful ideas. And um, it's hard to do, it's a skill. And, and Joe is very good at this. He says the way he put it in, in his uh, criticisms, and he does this in his conversations, which is, whoa, 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 stop, 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 stop. It, there's a kind of sense like, did you just say what you said? Hmm. Let's, let's make sure we get to the bottom, we clarify what you mean. Because uh, sometimes really big negative or difficult ideas can be said as a, as a, as a quick aside in a sentence, like it's nothing, uh, but it could be everything. And you wanna make sure you catch that and you you talk about it. And not, to, not as a gotcha, not as a kind of, way to destroy another human being, but to reveal something profound. And that's definitely something I wanna work on. I also want to say that, uh, as you said, you disagree with Joe on quite a lot of things. So for a long time, Joe was somebody that I was just a fan of, listened to, he's now a good friend. And I would say we disagree more than we agree. And uh, I love doing that. And, uh, but at the, at the same time, I learned from that. So it's like dual, like nobody in this world can tell me what to think. But I think everybody has a lesson to teach me. I think that's a good way to approach it. Like I, whenever somebody has words of criticism, I assume they're right and walk around with that idea mm. to really sort of empathize with that idea because there's a lesson there. And oftentimes, uh, my understanding of, of a topic becomes, uh, is altered completely or it becomes much more nuanced or much more, uh, or much richer for the, that kind of empathetic process. But definitely, I do not allow anybody to tell me what to think, whether it's Joe Rogan or uh, Fyodor Dostoevsky or Nietzsche or my parents or, um, the, the, like the proverbial girlfriend of which I don't actually have, like all the, <laughs> but, but she still busted my balls. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. In my imagination, I have a girlfriend in Canada that, I, yeah, that uh, I have imagining, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, imagining conversation. I so want to mention that, but also I, I, I don't know if you've gotten a chance to see this. I, I'd love to also mention this, um, Twitter feud between two other interesting people, which is uh, Brett Weinstein and Sam Harris, yeah. or Sam Harris and others in general. And uh, it kind of breaks my heart that these two people I listen to that are very thoughtful about a bunch of issues, let's, let's put COVID aside, because people are very emotional yeah. about this topic. I mean, I think they're deeply thoughtful and intelligent whether you agree with them or not. And I always learn something from their conversations and they are legitimately or have been for a long time friends. And it's a little bit heartbreaking to me to see that they basically don't talk in private anymore. 
and there's occasional jabs on Twitter. And um, I hope that changes. I hope that changes in general for COVID, that yeah. COVID brought out the, the, I would say, the most emotional sides of people, the worst in people. And um, I think there hasn't been enough love and empathy and compassion. And to see two people from whom I've learned a lot, whether it's Eric Weinstein, Brett Weinstein, Sam Harris, you can criticize them as much as you want, their ideas as much as you want. But if, if you're not sufficiently open-minded to admit that you have a lot to learn from their conversations, um, I think you're not being honest. And so I, I do hope they have those conversations and, and I hope we can kind of, I think there's a lot of repairing to be done post COVID yeah. um, of, of relationships, of conversations. And I think empathy and love can help a lot there. And this is also just a, I, I, I talked to uh, Sam privately, but this is also a public call out to, yeah. to put a little bit more uh, love in the world. Um, and and for these difficult conversations to to happen, because um, Brett Weinstein could be very wrong about a bunch of topics here around COVID, but he could also be right. And the only way to find out is to have those conversations, because there's a lot of people listening to both Sam Harris and Brett Weinstein. And uh, if you go into these uh, silos where uh, you just keep telling each other the uh, that you are the possessors of truth and nobody else is the possessor of truth, what starts happening is you both lose track or the capability of arriving at the truth because nobody's in the possession of the truth. So anyway, there's just a call out that we should have a little bit more conversation, I, a little bit more love. I totally agree, and uh, and both of those guys are guys who I uh, who I respect, and as you know, uh, Brett and again, as I mentioned, they're just a handful of us um, who were the early people raising questions about about the origins That's right. of this, so he of was, this he, pandemic. Right, he, he was there also talking. Yeah, so people have heard him speak quite a bit about antiviral drugs and all that kind of stuff. But he was also uh, raising concerns about lab leak early on. Yeah, exactly. And so, but I completely agree with you that uh, we don't have to agree with everybody, but it's great to have healthy conversations. That's how how we grow. And, and absolutely, um, we live in, in a world where we're kind of, if we're not careful, pushed into these little information pockets. And certainly on social media, I have different parts of my uh, of my life. One is focusing on issues of um, uh, of COVID origins, and then I have genetics and biotechnology, and then I have, which maybe we'll talk about later, one shared world, which is about how do we build a safer future. And when I say critical things like you know, the Chinese government, um, we have to demand a full investigation into pandemic origins. This is an outrage. Then it's really popular when I say let's build a better future for everyone in peace and love. It's like, wow, three people liked it and one was, one was my mother. And so I, I just feel like we need to build, we used to have that connectivity just built in um, because we had these town squares and, and you couldn't get away from them. Now we can get away from them. So the so engaging with people who are of a different background is really essential. I mean, I'm, I'm on Fox News sometimes, you know, three, four times, a week, and I wouldn't mean in my normal life. I'm not watching that much of um, uh, Fox News or even television more more generally. But I just feel like if I just speak to people who are very similar to me, maybe it'll be comfortable. Um, but what what have I contributed? And so I think we really have to have those those kinds of of conversations and and recognize that at the end of the day, most people want to be happy. They want to live in a better world. They maybe have different paths to get there. Um, but if we just break into camps that don't even connect with each other, that's a much more dangerous world. Let's dive back into the difficult pool. I, it, yes. Just like you said, in the English speaking world, it seems popular, almost easy to, to uh, demonize China the Chinese government, I should say. Uh, but even China, like there's this kind of uh, gray area that people just fall into. 
And I'm really uncomfortable with that. Perhaps because in my mind, in my heart, in my blood are echoes of the Cold War and that kind of tension. It it, it feels like we almost desire conflict. So we see demons when there is none. So I'm I'm a little like cautious to demonize, but at the same time, you have to be honest. So it's like uh, it, honest with the demons that are there and honest when they're not. <laughs> um, this is kind of a, a geopolitical therapy session of sorts. So l let's keep talking about China a little bit from different angles. So l let's return to um, the director of the Center of Emerging Infectious Disease at the Wuhan Institute of Virology, Shi Zheng Li, colloquially referred to as Batwoman. So do you think she's lying? Yes. Do you think she's being forced to lie? Yes. I've known a bunch of virologists in private and public conversation that respect her as a human being, I as a scientist. As a human being. Um, so, Sorry, as a scientist, yeah. not a human being. Because well, I, I think they don't know the human, they know the scientist and yeah. they respect her a lot as a scientist. Yeah, I, I respect her. I've never met her and we had one exchange, which I'll mention in a second in a, in a, a virtual forum, but I, I do respect her. I actually, I think that she is somebody who has tried to do the right thing. She was one of the heroes of tracking down the origins of the SARS-1 and that was a major uh, contribution. Um, but as we, we talked about earlier, it's it, it's a different thing living, being a scientist or really kind of anything. It's different being one of those people in an authoritarian society um, than it is being in a different type of society. And so when Shu Zheng Li said that the reason the, um, uh, the uh, WIV database was taken offline in September 19 was because of computer hacks, I don't think that's the story. I don't think she thinks that's, uh, that's the story. Um, when I asked her in March of 2021, March of this year, in a Rutgers online forum, uh, when I asked her whether the Chinese military had any engagement with the Wuhan Institute of Virology in any way, and she said, absolutely not, paraphrasing, I think she was lying. Do I think that she had the ability to say, well, either... One, yes, but I can't talk about it. Or I know there are a lot of things that are happening at this institute that I don't know about, and that could be one. Uh, could she have said um, that the uh, the personnel at the Wuhan Institute of Virology have all had to go through classification training um, to so that they can know about what can and, and can't be said? Like she could have said all those things, but she couldn't say, all of those things. And so, um, and I think that's why so many, at least in my view, so many people uh, in the, certainly in the Western world, got this story wrong from the beginning. Because if your only prism was the science, and you just assumed the, this is a science question to be left to the scientists, Shu Zheng Li is, uh, is just like any scientist working in Switzerland or Norway. Uh, the Chinese government isn't interfering in, in any way, um, and we can trust them, that would lead you down one path. Uh, in my view, the reason why I, I progressed as I did is I felt like I had two keys. I had one key as I live in the, in the science world through my work with WHO and my books and, and things like that. Uh, but I also have another part of my life in the world of geopolitics as a uh, an Asia quote unquote expert and former National Security Council official and, and other things. And I felt for me, I needed both keys to open that that door. Uh, but if I only had the science key, I wouldn't have had the level of doubt and suspicion that I have. But if my starting point was only doubt and suspicion, well, it's coming from China, it must be that the government is guilty, like that wouldn't help either. I wonder what's in her mind, whether it's fear or habit. Because I think um, a lot of people in the former Soviet Union, it's like Chernobyl, it's not really fear. It's almost like a momentum. It's like um, it's like the reason I, I showed up to this interview wearing clothes as opposed to being naked. It's like, all right, <laughs> it's like, 
It's just I've, all of us are doing the, right. the clothes thing. Although you, uh, there was a startup years ago called Naked News. Did you ever hear about that? They just would read the exact news. But naked. No, they would, they, oh. after each story, they'd take something off something. until the end. They were, they were I, don't, I don't think- it's a good idea for yeah, a podcast. They, they have an next, IPO. Stay yet, tuned. You know. Next time I'm with uh, yeah. Michael Mouse. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> so what do you think? I mean, because the reason I asked that question is, how do we kind of take steps to improve without any kind of revolutionary action? You could say we need to uh, inspire the Chinese people to elect, uh, to, to sort of revolutionize the system from within. Um, but like, who are we to suggest that? Because we have our flaws too. We should be working on our flaws as well. And so, but at, at the individual scientist level, what are the small acts of rebellion that could be done? How can we improve this? Well, so I don't know about small acts of uh, of rebellion, but I'll, I'll try to answer your question from a few uh, a few different perspectives. So, right now, actually, as we speak, um, there is a special session of the World Health Assembly going on, and the World Health Assembly is the governing authority over the World Health Organization, where it's represented by states and territories, 194 of them, tragically not including uh, Taiwan uh, because of uh, the Chinese government's assistance. But they're now beginning a process of trying to negotiate a global pandemic treaty to try to have a better process for responding to crises exactly like, uh, like we're in. But unfortunately, for the exact same reasons that we have failed, I mean, we had the, a similar process after the first SARS. We set up what we thought was the best available system, and it has totally failed here. And it's failed here because of the inherent pathologies of the Chinese government system. We are suffering from a pandemic that exists because of the internal pathologies of the Chinese state. And that's why on one hand, I totally get this impulse. Well, we do it our way, they do it their way. Who's to say that, uh, that one way is better? And certainly right now in the United States, we're at each other's throats. We have a hard time getting anything meaningful done. Um, and I'm sure there are people who are saying, well, that model looks, uh, looks appealing. But just as um, people could look to the United States and say, well, because the United States has such a massive reach, what we do domestically has huge implications for the rest of the world. They become stakeholders in our in our politics. And that's why I think for a lot of years, people have just been looking at US politics, not because it's interesting, but because the decisions that we make have big implications for their lives. The same is true for ours. You could say that the lack of of civil and political rights in China is the the I mean, it's, it's up to the Chinese, not even people, because they have no say, but to their uh, their government, and they weren't democratically elected, but that they are recognized as uh, as the government. But some significant percentage of the 15 million people now dead from COVID are dead because in the earliest days following the outbreak, whatever whatever the origin the voices of people sounding the alarm were suppressed. That the Chinese government had, an, just like in Chernobyl, the Chinese government had a greater incentive to lie um, to the international community than to tell, to tell the truth. And everybody was incentivized to pretty much do the wrong thing. And so that's, I mean, that's why I think one of the big messages of this pandemic is that all of our fates are tied to everybody else's fates. And so while we, we can say and should say, well, let's focus on our own communities and our, and our countries, we're all stakeholders in what happens elsewhere. Can I ask you a, a weird uh, question? So I'm, I'm gonna do a, a few podcast interviews with uh, interesting people in Russia, in the Russian language, because mm -hmm. I could speak Russian. Um, and a lot of those people have, you know, are not usually speaking in these kinds of formats. Um, do you think it's possible to interview Xi Zhen Li? Do you think it's possible to interview somebody like her or anyone in the Chinese government? I think not. Um, 
And I think the reason is because I think they would, one, be uncomfortable being in any environment where really unknown questions will be uh, will be asked. And I, I actually, I was, so as you know, on this topic, uh, the Chinese, as I mentioned earlier, the Chinese government has a gag order on Chinese scientists. They can't speak without prior government approval. Shu Zheng Li has been able to speak. I mean, she's spoken at a number of forums. I mentioned uh, this Rutgers uh, event. Yeah, what was the nature of that forum? The, the it was, Rutgers it was, event? A, it was, a, a, all of them were kind of science conversations um, about, uh, about the pandemic, including the, uh, the origins issue. Um, but I think that she, in, in her response to my question, it was kind of this, this funny thing. So they had this event for, uh, for organized by Rutgers and I went on, it was an online event on zoom. Um, but I got on there and I just realized it was very poorly organized. Like normally the controls that you would have about who gets to chat to who, who gets to ask questions, none of them were, were set. And so I kind of couldn't believe it. I was just sitting at home in my in my neon green fleece, and I just started sending sending chat messages to Shu Zheng Li. So you could yeah, anybody could send anybody any could. It was insane. And so I, but I thought, wow, this is incredible. And so then it was unclear who got to ask questions. And so I was like posting questions, and then I was sending chats to the organizers of the event, saying, I really have a question. Um, and first they said, well, you can submit your questions and we'll have, um, submitted questions. And then if we have time, we'll open up. So I just, I mean, I just thought, well, what the hell? I just sent messages to everybody. And then the event was already done. They were 15 minutes over time. And then they said, all right, we have time just for one question. And it's, uh, Jamie Metzl. And like, I was, I'm sitting there in my running clothes. Like I wasn't, I was like <laughs> multitasking and I heard my name. And so I, I went diving back and I asked, this this question um, about did you know all of the work that was happening at the Wuhan Institute of uh, Virology, not just uh, your work, um, and can you confirm um, that U.S. intelligence has said that the military um, played a role, uh, it was engaged with the Wuhan Institute of Virology? Do you deny that the Chinese military was involved in any way with the Wuhan Institute of Virology? And as I said before, she said. This is you know crazy. Absolutely uh, not. It got it actually got that one question got covered in the media because it was like I think an, an essential question. But I, I just think that since then, to my knowledge, she's not been in any public forums. But that's why most people would be shocked that to date there has been no comprehensive international investigation into pandemic origins. There is no whistleblower provision. So if you're a, my guess is there are at least tens, maybe hundreds of people in China who have relevant information about the origins of the pandemic who are terrified and don't dare share it. And let's just say somebody wanted to get that information out, to send it somewhere. There's no official address. The WHO doesn't, uh, doesn't have that. Nobody has that. And so I would love, I mean, you may as well ask. I don't think it's likely that um, there'll be a yes. But it could well, well be that there are defectors who will will want to speak. So let me also push back this idea. So one, I, I want to ask if the, the language barrier is a thing, because I've uh, talked to so the, I've understand Russian culture. I think or not understand. This is this. I don't. I, I don't understand basically anything in this world. But I mean, I, I hear the music that uh, that is Russian culture, and I enjoy it. I don't hear that music for Chinese culture. It's just not something I've experienced. So it's a beautiful, rich, complex culture. For sure. And uh, from my sense, it seems distant to me. Like I, it like whenever I look, even like we mentioned offline Japan and so on. I probably don't even understand Japanese culture. I, I believe I kind of do because I did martial arts my whole life, but even that is just so, so distant. People who've lived in Japan, foreigners for like 20 years, say the exact same thing. Yeah. It makes me sad. It makes me sad because I can't, I will never be able to fully appreciate the literature, the conversations, the the people, the little humor and the subtleties. And those are all essential to understand even this cold topics of science because yeah. all of that is 
important to understand. So th that's a question for me if you think language barrier is a thing. But the other, the other thing I just want to kind of comment on is um, the is the criticism of journalism that uh, somebody like uh, Xi Jinping Li or even Xi Jinping, so the guy, just anybody in China, is very skeptical to have really conversations with anybody in the Western media. Yeah, because it it's like what are the odds that they will uh, try to bring out the beautiful ideas in the person? And honestly, just this is a harsh criticism. I apologize, but I kind of mean it. Is the journalists that have some of these high profile conversations often don't do the work. They come off as not very intelligent and I know they're intelligent people. They have not done the research. They have not come up and like read a bunch of books. They have not even read the Wikipedia article, meaning put in the minimal effort to empathize, to try to understand the culture of the people, all the complexities, all the different ideas in the spaces, all, do all the incredible, not all, but some of the incredible work that you've done initially. Like that, you have to do that work to earn the right to have a deep, real conversation with uh, with some of these folks. And it's, it's just disappointing to me that journalists often don't do that work. Yeah, so on that, just first, I completely agree with you. I mean, there is just an incredible beauty in Chinese culture, and I think all cultures, but certainly China has such a deep and rich history, amazing literature and art and um, and just human beings. I mean, I'm, I'm a massive critic of the Chinese government. I'm very vociferous about the really genocide in Xinjiang, the absolute effort to destroy uh, Tibetan culture, the the destruction of democracy in Hong Kong, um, incredibly illegal efforts to seize basically the entire South China Sea. And I could go on and on uh, and on. But Chinese culture is fantastic. And I, mean, I can't speak to every technical field, but just in terms of having journalists, and I'll, I'll speak to American journalists, people like Peter Hessler, who have really invested the time to live in China, to learn the language, learn the culture. Peter himself, who is maybe one of our best journalists covering China from a soul level, um, he was kicked out of uh, of China, so it's it's very very uh, difficult. It's tough. It's tough. And so yeah, it's really and so for me, you, you talked about my website on pandemic origins. So when I launched it, uh, I had it. I, I'm not a Chinese speaker, but I had the entire site translated into Chinese, and I have it up on my uh, on my on my website just because I felt like well if. If somebody, I mean, the, the, the great firewall makes it very, very difficult for people in China to access, uh, access that kind of, uh, of information. But I figured if somebody gets there and they want to have it in their own, their own language, um, but it's hard because the Chinese government is, uh, is represented by these quote unquote wolf warriors, which is, it's like these basic ruffians. And I personally was condemned by name. Um, by the spokesman of the Chinese foreign ministry from the podium in Beijing. Uh, and so it's it's really hard because I, I absolutely think um, the American people and the Chinese people, I mean, maybe all people, but we have so much in common. I mean, uh, yes, um, China is an ancient civilization, um, but they kind of wiped out their own civilization in the Great Leap Forward and Cultural Revolution. They burned their scrolls, they smashed their artworks. Um, and so it's a very young society, kind of like America is a, is a young society. So we have a lot in, in common. Um, and if we just kind of got out of our own ways, we could have a beautiful relationship. Um, but there's a lot of things that are happening. Certainly the United States feels responsible to defend the post-war international order that, that you know, past generations helped build. And I'm a certain, certain believer in that. And, and China is challenging that. And the you know, Chinese government, and, and they've shared that with that view with the Chinese people, feel that they haven't been adequately respected. And now they're building a massive nuclear, uh, nuclear arsenal and, and all these other things to try to position themselves in the world with an articulated goal of being the lead country in the world. And that puts them at odds with the United States. So there, there are a lot of real reasons that we need to be honest about for division. 
But if that's all we focus about, uh, focus on, if we don't say that there's another side of the story that brings us together, we'll put ourselves on an inevitable glide path to a terrible outcome. We mentioned Eric, uh, Eric Weinstein. I know you agree on a bunch of things. Is there some beautiful, fascinating, insightful disagreement that you have that has yet to be resolved with him? Is there some ideas that you guys battle 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 it out on? Is it the stagnation question that you mentioned? That's one of them, but here's at least two others. <laughs> but I would stress Eric is always evolving. So I'm just talking about a time slice, Eric, right? I don't know where he's at right now. Yeah. Like I heard him on Clubhouse three nights ago, but that was three nights ago. Yeah. <laughs> but I think he's far too pessimistic about the impact of immigration on U.S. science. He thinks it has displaced U.S. scientists, which I think that is partly true. I just think we've gotten better talent. I'm like, bring it on, double down. Mm. And look at Carico, you know, who basically came up with mRNA vaccines. She was from Hungary and uh, was ridiculed and mocked. She couldn't get her papers published. She stuck at it. Uh, an American might not have been so stubborn because we have these cushions. So Eric is all worried, you know, like mathematicians coming in, they're discouraging native U.S. citizens from doing math. I'm like, yeah. bring in the best people. If we all end up in other avocations, absolutely fine by me. Does it trouble you that we kick them out after they get a degree often? I would give anyone with a plausible graduate degree a green card, universally. Yeah, that's I, I agree with that. It makes no sense. It makes so strange that the best people that come here suffer here, create awesome stuff here, then when we kick them out, it doesn't make any sense. Here's another view I have. I call it open borders for Belarus. <laughs> now, Russia is a big country. I would gladly like increase the Russian quota yeah. by 3x, 4x, 5x, like I not 20%, but a big boost. But Belarus, <laughs> small country, yeah. like why can't, and yeah. they're poor yeah. and they have decent education. And a lot of talent there. Why can't we just open the door yeah. and convert a Belarus passport to a green card? Open borders for Belarus. It's my new campaign <laughs> slogan. <laughs> are you running for president in 2024? <laughs> well, write-ins are welcome. But <laughs> okay. uh, what's, the, what's the second thing you disagree with, Eric? Uh, trade. Again, I'm not sure where he's at now, but he is suspicious of trade in a way that I am not. Mm -hmm. I do understand what's called the China shock has been a big problem for the U.S. middle class. I fully accept that. I think most of that is behind us. National security issues aside, I think free trade is very much a good thing. Eric, I'm not sure he'll say it's not a good thing, but he won't say it is a good thing. And I know he's kind of, eh, it's like, Eric, free trade. But look, on things like vaccines, I don't believe in free trade. Why? You want vaccine production in your own country. Look at the EU. Mm -hmm. They have enough money. No one will send them vaccines. What's different about vaccines? Is it There's some things you want to prioritize the citizenry on. And you could argue it would be cheaper to produce all U.S. manufactured vaccines in India. Mm -hmm. They have the technologies, uh, obviously lower wages. But look, there's talk in India right now of cutting off the export of vaccines. If you outsource your vaccine production, you're not sure the other country will respect the norm of free trade. So you need to keep some vaccine production in your country. It's an exception to free trade, not to the logic. Uh, a bunch of things the Navy uses. You can't buy those components from China. Like mm -hmm. That's insane. But look, it would be cheaper to do so, right? Yeah. Do you think, uh, you know, some people I've talked to, Eric Weinstein, you've talked to Eric Weinstein, uh, he has a sense that growth, uh, you know, like the, the the entirety of the American system is based on the assumption that we're going to grow forever, that the economy is going to grow forever. Do you think uh, uh, economic growth will continue indefinitely or will we stagnate? I've long been in agreement with Eric Peter Thiel uh, Robert Gordon and others, that growth has slowed down. I argued that in my book, The Great Stagnation, uh, appropriately titled. But the last two years, I've become much more optimistic. I've seen a lot of breakthroughs in green energy and battery technology. mRNA vaccines and medicine is a big deal already. It will repair our GDP and save millions of lives around the world. 
Uh, there's an anti-malaria vaccine that's now in stage three trial. It probably works. CRISPR to defeat sickle cell anemia. Just space, area after area after area. There's suddenly the surge of breakthroughs. I would say many of them rooted in superior computation and ultimately Moore's law and access to those computational abilities. So I'm much more optimistic than, say, the last time I spoke to Eric. I don't know. He he moves all the time in his views. I don't know where he's at now. He's not at, he hasn't gained. That's really interesting. So your little drop of optimism comes from, like, uh, there might be a, a fundamental shift in the kind of things that computation has unlocked for us in terms of, like, it could be a wellspring of innovation that, can, that uh, uh, enables growth for a long time to come. Like, Eric has not quite connected to the computation aspect yet to where it could be a, a wellspring of innovation. But you're I, very close to it in your own work. I don't yes. have to tell you that. The work you're doing would not have been possible not very long ago. But the question is, how much does that work enable continued growth for decades to come? That's, for all their problems, some version of driverless vehicles will be a thing. I'm not sure when. You know much better than I do. Maybe only partially. But that too will be a big deal. Well, one of the open questions that sort of the Peter Thiel school of, uh, area of ideas is how much can be converted to technology? How much, can, how many parts of our lives can technology integrate and then innovate? Like, can, can it replace uh, healthcare? Can, can, you know, can, can it replace the legal system? Can it replace government? Not replace, but like, you know, uh, make it digital and thereby enable computation to improve it, right? That's the open question because many aspects of our lives are still not really that uh, digitized. There was a New York Times symposium in April, which is not long ago, and they asked the so-called experts, when are we going to get vaccines? And the most optimistic answer was in four years. Yeah, And obviously we beat that by a long mile so I think people still haven't woken up. You mentioned yeah. my tiny drop of optimism, but it's a big drop of <laughs> optimism. Is it, is it a waterfall yet? I mean, is it, is it just... <laughs> well, here's my pessimism. Whenever there are major new technologies, they also tend to be used for violence, directly or indirectly. Yeah. Radio, Hitler. Not that he hit people over the head with radios, but it enabled the rise of various dictators. Yeah. So the new technologies now, whatever exactly they may be, they're going to cause a lot of trouble. Yeah. And that's my pessimism. Not that I think they're all going to slow to a trickle. When was the stagnation book? 2011. 2011. Yes. It was the first of the stagnation books, in fact. <laughs> it's, it's very interesting. Uh, but even then, I said, this is temporary. And I was predicting it would be gone in about 20 years' time. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure that's exactly the right prediction, like 2030, but I think we're actually going to beat that. So you think uh, the United States might still be on top of the world for the rest of the century in terms of its economic uh, economic growth, impact on the world, scientific innovation, all those kinds of things? That's too long to predict, but I'm bullish on America in general. <laughs> <laughs> Eric Weinstein speaks very highly of you, which is very surprising to me at first because I didn't know there's this depth to you because I knew you as, a, as, a, as an, an amazing person leader of engineers and an engineer yourself and so on. So it's fascinating. <laughs> Maybe just as a comment, uh, a side tangent that we can take, uh, what's your nature of your friendship with Eric Weinstein? How did the two, how did <laughs> such two interesting paths cross? Is it your origins in physics? Is it your interest in philosophy and the ideas of how yeah, the world uh, works? What is it? It's actually, it's very random. It's uh, Eric found me. Um, he actually found Travis uh, and, and I. Um, Travis Oliphant. Oliphant. Yeah, we were both working at a company called Enthought uh, back in the mid 2000s, and we we're doing um, a lot of consulting around scientific Python. Um, and we'd made some some tools, and uh, Eric was trying to use some of these Python tools to visualize. He had a fiber bundle approach to uh, modeling certain aspects of economics. He was doing this, and that, that's how he kind of got in touch with us. And so. Um, this was in the early. This aughts, was in the mid mid two thousands. Oh seven time frame. Oh six. Oh seven. Eric time frame. Weinstein trying to use Python right to visualize, to visualize fiber, fiber bundles, bundles uh, using some of the tools that we that we built in the open source. 
that's somehow entertaining to me. <laughs> the thought funny. of that. It's pretty funny. But then, um, you know, we met with him a couple of times, really interesting guy. And then in the wake of the 07, 08 kind of financial collapse, he uh, helped organize with Lee Smolin um, a symposium at the Perimeter Institute about, um, okay, well, clearly, you know, big finance can't be trusted. Government's in its pockets with regulatory capture. What the F do we do? Um, and all sorts of people, Nassim Tlaib was there and uh, Andy Lowe from MIT was there and, you know, uh, Bill Janeway. I mean, just a lot of, you know, top billing people were there. And he invited me and uh, Travis and uh, uh, another one of our coworkers, uh, Robert Kern, uh, who is a, anyone in the SciPy, NumPy community knows Robert, um, really great guy. So the three of us also got invited to go to this thing. And that's where I met Brett Weinstein for the first time as well. Yeah, I knew him before he got all famous <laughs> for unfortunate reasons, I guess. But, uh, but, but anyway, we um, so we met then and kind of had a friendship, um, you know, throughout since since then. You have a depth of thinking that uh, kind of runs with Eric in terms of just thinking about the world deeply and thinking philosophically, and then there's Eric's interest in programming. <laughs> I actually have never, um, you know, he'll bring up programming to mm -hmm. me quite a bit as a metaphor for stuff. Right. But I never kind of pushed the point of like, what's the nature of your interest in programming? I think you saw it probably as a tool. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the, to visualize, to explore mathematics and explore physics. But yep. and I was wondering like, what's the, his uh, depth of interest and also his uh, vision for what programming would look like in the future. Have you have you had interaction with him, like discussion in the space of Python no, and programming? Well, um, in the sense of sometimes he asks me, why is this stuff still so hard? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, you know, everybody's a critic. But uh, but actually, no, Eric- uh, Programming, Eric, you mean, like in yes, general? Yes, yes. Well, pro not programming in general, but certain things in the Python ecosystem. <laughs> but, he, uh, but he actually, I think what I find in listening to some of his stuff is that he does uh, use programming metaphors a lot, right? He'll talk about APIs or object-oriented and things like that. So I think that's a useful set of frames for him to draw upon for uh, discourse. Um, I haven't pair programmed with him in a very long time, you've if ever. you've previously well, I mean, like, look at this code, trying to trying to help like put together some of the visualizations around these things. But it's been a very not really pair program, but like yeah. even looked at his code, right? I mean, how legendary would be is that like uh, Git repo <laughs> with Peter Wang and Eric Weinstein? Well, collab. honestly, honestly, Robert Kern did all the heavy lifting, so I have to give credit where credit is due. Robert is is the silent but incredibly deep, um, quiet, not silent, but quiet but incredibly deep individual at the heart of a lot of those things that Eric was trying to do. Um, but we did have, you know, in the, as Travis and I were starting our company in um, 2012 timeframe, we went to New York. Eric was still in New York at the time. He hadn't moved to, this was before he joined Teal Capital. We just had like a steak dinner somewhere. Maybe it was Keynes. I don't know. Somewhere in New York. So it was me, Travis, Eric, and then Wes McKinney, the creative pandas. And then Wes's is um, then business partner, Adam. The five of us sat around having this, just a, hilarious time, amazing dinner. Um, I forget what all we talked about, but it was it was one of those conversations which I wish um, as soon as COVID is over, maybe Eric and I can sit down. Recreate. So recreate it somewhere <laughs> in uh, in LA. Or maybe he comes here because a lot of cool people are here in Austin, right? Exactly. Yeah, we're all exactly. here. He should Eric, come here. Can you linger on that a little bit? How do we get E equals MC squared? So where does the mass come from? So Okay, okay. I mean, I, but, yeah, without, right. is there an intuitive? So okay, F first of all, you're pretty deep in the mathematical explorations of this thing right now. We're in a very, we're in a flux uh, currently. So maybe you haven't even had time to think about intuitive explanations, uh, but. Yeah, I mean, th so, uh, this, one, this one is, is look, r roughly what's happening, that derivation is actually rather easy. Yeah. And everybody, and I've been saying we should pay more attention to this derivation because it's such, you know, because people care about this one. And everybody says, it's just easy. <laughs> it's, it's easy. Th that, but so there's some concept of energy that uh, can be intuitively thought of as the activity, the, yes. the flux, the level, the level of uh, changes that are occurring based on the transformations within a certain volume, however the heck do you find the volume. Okay, so, and then mass. Well, is mass is what? Is, Mass is associated with kind of the energy that does not cause you to, that does not somehow propagate through time. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that was not obvious in the usual formulation of special relativity is that space and time are connected in a certain way, 
energy moment and momentum are also connected in a certain way. The fact that the connection of energy to momentum is analogous to the connection to space between space and time is not self-evident in ordinary relativity. Mm -hmm. It is a consequence of this of the way this model works. It's an intrinsic consequence of the way this model works. And it's all to do with that, with with unraveling that connection that ends up giving you this this relationship between energy and um, and uh, well, it's energy, momentum, mass, they're all connected. And um, and so like uh that's hence the general relativity you have a sense that uh it appears to be baked in to the fundamental properties of the way these hypergraphs are evolved. Well, I didn't yet get to, so I, I got as far as special relativity and e equals mc squared. The one last step is in general relativity, the, the final connection is energy and mass cause curvature in space. And that's something that when you understand this interpretation of energy, and you kind of understand the correspondence to curvature in hypergraphs, then you can finally sort of the, the big final answer is you derive the full version of Einstein's equations for space, time, and matter. Um, and that's... Um, so is that, have you, that last piece with curvature, have, is that, have you arrived there yet? Oh yeah, we're, we're there, yes. And, and here's, the, here's the way that we, here's how we're really, really going to know we've arrived, okay? So, you know, we have the mathematical derivation, it's all fine, but, but you know, mathematical derivations, okay, so one thing that's sort of a, a uh, you know, we're taking this limit of what happens when, you, you, the limit, you have to look at things which are large compared to the size of an elementary length, small compared to the whole size of the universe, large compared to certain kinds of fluctuations, blah, blah, blah. There's a, there's a, there's a tower of many, many of these mathematical limits that have to be taken. So if you're a pure mathematician saying, where's the precise proof? It's like, well, there are all these limits. We can, you know, we can try each one of them computationally and we could say, yeah, it really works. But the formal mathematics is really hard to do. I mean, for example, in the case of deriving the equations of fluid dynamics from molecular dynamics, that derivation has never been done. Mm -hmm. There is no rigorous version of that derivation. So, so Because that you can't do the limits? Yeah, because you can't do the limits. Um, but and, so the limits allow you to try to describe something general about the system and very, very particular kinds of limits that you need to take with these very... Right, and, and the limits will definitely work the way we think they work, and we yeah. can do all kinds of computer experiments. It's just a hard derivation. Can, yeah, it's just, it's just the mathematical structure kind of, in, uh, you know, ends up running right into computational irreducibility, right. and you end up with a bunch, of, a bunch of difficulty there. But here's the way that we're getting really confident that we know completely what we're talking about, which is... When people study things like black hole mergers using Einstein's equations, what do they actually do? Well, they actually use Mathematica or a whole bunch to analyze the equations and so on. But in the end, they do numerical relativity, which means they take these nice mathematical equations and they break them down so that they can run them on a computer and they break them down into something which is actually a discrete approximation to these equations. Then they run them on a computer, they get results. Then you look at the gravitational waves and you see if they match. Okay. Mm -hmm. Turns out that our model gives you a direct way to do numerical relativity. So in other words, instead of saying you start from these continuum equations from Einstein, you break them down into these discrete things, you run them on a computer, you say, we're doing it the other way around. We're starting from these discrete things that come from our model, and we're just running big versions of them on a the computer. And uh, you know, what we're saying is, and this is, this is how things will work. So what I'm, the way I'm calling this is, is proof by compilation, so to speak. <laughs> proof that, by is, that is, in other words, you're, you're taking um, something where, you know, we've got this description of a black hole system, and what we're doing is we're, we're showing that the, you know, what we get by just running our model agrees with what you would get by doing the computation from the Einstein equations. What are your... Uh, I mean, you've talked with him, but just as a matter of personalities, because it's a beautiful story, what are your thoughts about Eric Weinstein's work? I, you know, I, I think his, his um, I mean, he did a PhD thesis in mathematical physics yep. at Harvard. He's a mathematical physicist. Um, and, and, you know, it's, uh, it, it seems like it's kind of, uh, you know, it's, it's in that framework, and it's kind of like, I, I'm not sure how much further it's got than his PhD thesis, which was 20 years ago or something. And I, yeah. I think that, you know, the the you know it's a fairly specific piece of mathematical physics that's quite nice and um, 
What um, trajectory do you hope it takes? I mean, well, I think in, in his particular case, I mean, from what I understand, which is not everything at all, but you know, I think I know the rough tradition at least of. He's operating in is sort of theory of gauge theories. Gauge theories, yeah. Local gauge invariance and so on. Okay. We are very close to understanding how local gauge invariance works in our models, and it's very beautiful, and it's very um and you know, does some of the mathematical structure that he's enthusiastic about fit? Quite possibly, yes. So there might be a possibility of trying to understand how those things fit, how gauge theory yeah, fits. Might very well. I mean, the, the question fit. is, you know, so there are a couple of things one might try to get in the world. So, for example, it's like, can we get three dimensions of space? We haven't managed to get that yet. Gauge theory, the standard model of particle physics says that it's SU3 cross SU2 cross U1. Those are the designations of these um, Lie groups. Um, it doesn't, but but anyway. So those are those are sort of representations of symmetries of the theory, and um, so you know it is conceivable that it is generically true. Okay, so all those are subgroups of a group called E eight, which is a weird, exceptional Lie group. Mm -hmm. Okay, it is conceivable. I don't know whether it's the case that that will be generic in these models. That it will be generic. That the gauge invariance of the model has this property, just as things like general relativity, which corresponds to a thing called uh, uh, general covariance, which is another gauge-like invariance. It could conceivably be the case that the kind of local gauge invariance that we see in particle physics is somehow generic. Mm. And, and that would be a, you know, the thing that's, that's really cool, I think, you know, sociologically, although this hasn't really hit yet, is that all of these different things, all these different things people have been working on in these, in some cases, quite abstruse areas of mathematical physics, an awful lot of them seem to tie into what we're doing. And, you know, it and might not a, be that way. Yeah, but, absolutely. That's a beautiful thing of the theory. I mean, but the reason I, so the reason Eric Weinstein is important is to the point that you mentioned before, which is, it's strange that the theory of everything is not at the core of uh, the passion, the dream, the focus, the funding of the physics community. It's uh, too hard. It's too hard and people gave up. I mean, basically what happened is, ancient Greece, people thought we're nearly there. You know, the world is made of platonic solids. It's, you know, water is a tetrahedron or something. Yes. We're almost there, okay? Long period of time where people were like, no, we don't know how it works. You know, time of Newton, uh, you know, we're almost there. Everything is gravitation. You know, time of Faraday and Maxwell, we're almost there. Everything is fields. Everything is the ether. You know, then... And uh, the whole time we're making big progress, though. Oh, yes, absolutely. But the fundamental theory of physics is almost a footnote because it's like it's the machine code. It's like we're operating in the high-level languages. Yeah. Um, you know, that's what we really care about. That's what's relevant for our everyday physics. So you talked about different centuries and the 21st century will be uh, everything's computation. Yes. If that yes. takes us all the way, we don't know, but it might take us pretty far. Yes, right, that's right. And I, but I think the point is that it's like, you know, if you're doing biology, you might say, how can you not be really interested in the origin of life and the definition of life? Well, it's irrelevant. You know, you're studying the properties of some virus. Yeah. It doesn't matter, you know, where, you know, the, you're, you're operating at some much higher level. And it's the same, what, what's happened with physics is, I was sort of surprised actually, I was sort of mapping out this history of, of people's efforts to understand the fundamental theory of physics. And it's remarkable how little has been done on this question. And it's, you know, because, uh, you know, there've been times when there's been bursts of enthusiasm. Oh, we're almost there. Mm -hmm. and, and then it decays and, and people just say, oh, it's too hard, but it's not relevant anyway. And I think that the, um, the thing that, um, you know, so, so the question of, of, you know, one question is why does anybody, why should anybody care? Right? Why should anybody care what the fundamental theory of physics is? I think it's intellectually interesting, but what will be the sort of, what will be the impact of this? Yeah. What, I mean, like give it a chance, give it a chance to see the beauty. And that- give it your respect. respect. So there is one person who does take time and is what I consider to be a great scientist in terms of what he thinks. He obviously has an invested interest in his own theory and it's Eric. Yeah. Eric's got a truly encyclopedic knowledge of the history of physics, and he has a, a great warmth and graciousness when it comes to 
giving other, and I've witnessed this and I've had, look, first of all, I think debate is pointless. Like, I don't know about you, but if you've ever voted like, oh, I saw this debate and, you know, because uh, Trump did so badly, now I'm going to vote for Biden. No, it never happened. You almost never change anybody's mind unless you debate with love, unless you have almost like we're going to win together like the red team approach in the military, they're trying to win a war. So they may disagree on this, on the tactics day to day, but the strategy, we have to win this war. I love you and I want to protect you. I don't see that in very many of these physicists from Kaku. I almost see it. It's embarrassing in some ways because they'll, they'll almost mock with the exception of Eric, you know, Garrett's interesting. You know, his theory is, you know, people have a lot of issues, very technical, uh, but Eric has taken the time to try to understand it. Eric has taken the time to understand Peter White's theory. And I, I don't see, I don't see the same graciousness extended from them. I'm sorry. To yeah, say. essentially, you're, you're right. You're right. I mean, with Eric, he, he hasn't, he, he wants to, but he hasn't extended the same for Stephen Wolfram because I think, no, Wolf. he did. No, actually, no, he did. he did. I had a debate with them live on my show. No, I did. I, I listened yeah. to it, but like, I, I just think it's outside of the toolkit uh, that Eric is comfortable with. So it's not. It's not that he's not. But you're the main thing that's often absent, and Eric does have is like the willingness and like not just like dismissing or mocking the that he's he's reaching out. But okay, I mean, what if it's not? You know, I made a joke when they were on. I was like, how many theories of everything can there be? You know, Highlander, you know, there can be only one, you know, I don't know, maybe. But he, of course, also like the other folks mm -hmm. who propose a theory has uh, an ego. Yeah. He, uh, he rides a dragon, <laughs> with the dragon representing the ego. Well, let me ask you about your friend, Eric Weinstein. So he proposed initial sketches of geometric unity which is his theory of everything. Maybe you can elucidate some aspect of it that you find interesting. But um, what do you think about the response he got from the scientific community? Well, you know, some of the response came from people, academicians, professors. Some came from a lay audience and some came from trained scientists who are no longer, you know, maybe practicing in universities. Um, I thought it was, there was a lot of vitriol which su surprised me because <clears throat> I look at what he's trying to do and it was always, the vitriol would always come with some element of ad hominem. Um, and maybe that's his personality. Maybe that engenders this or whatever. Maybe there is kind of just a natural tendency. You know, I always get these emails, Professor Keating. Um, I have a new theory. Einstein was wrong. I'm going to prove it. I'm not good at math. But if you help me, I will share my Nobel Prize with you. And I'm like, right. oh, thanks. Have you read my books? You know, um, <clears throat> in other words, it's always taking down, taking down the dragon. It's always taking down the kung fu master, right? That you get the hit points from D and D. You get their hit points. You take their cards. You get their risk tokens from Kamchaka. And thinking about <laughs> with Eric, it's like because what he's doing is so aspirational. It is grandiose in a good sense. What he's trying to do is is construct a geometric theory of everything that has aspects of supersymmetry and set of stuff embedded in it. He's trying to meld that. It has very um, unusual features in that it features not only multiple spatial dimensions, multiple time dimensions. It uses new mathematical objects that he's invented. And look, I had uh, you know had him on my show. I've talked with him. We've had consultations with other physicists. You know where he'll come down, and I have a visitor's office, and he comes down to San Diego sometimes and spends time there. And we talk with eminent mathematicians and physicists. Um, Eric's uh, been out of the academic world for a long time, and there is, as I said before, an aspect of persuasion that must take place in order to get anything through. And I think. There was a slight amount of um, good nature, not ignorance, naivete, but just the sense that if this is right, everyone will recognize it. If you build a better mousetrap, the world will beat a path to your door, as the expression goes. That's completely untrue. That almost not, that doesn't even happen with mousetraps. I mean, you know how many freaking mousetrap types there are? It's like, no, they don't beat a path to your door. You have to sell that freaking thing. You have to sell it like Steve Jobs or Elon. You... I have never, I've had one paper out of 200 papers I've published in peer-reviewed journals. I've only had one, half a percent, published with no referee's comments. In other words, published like Dream, submitted it, published, and it happened to be in a prestigious journal. So I was pretty psyched about that. But you almost have to crave the response, getting it back from a journal. And I think he doesn't see, first of all, he doesn't subscribe to the peer review process. He thinks that is anathema to the way science is, it vests interest in public, in journals, et cetera, et cetera. 
I think it, you can have elements of peer review that are substantive and valuable. Um, I think you have to learn from your critics. One of my conversations with John Mather, he talks about loving your critics in this book, um, but not being so open to their criticism that their criticism goes to your heart and not being so open to their compliments that their compliments go to your head. It's a very tough Scylla and Charybdis to walk. Well, uh, there's something, I mean, I want to be careful here because I'd, I'd like to talk to Eric about yeah. this uh, directly, but I'll just, from a from a perspective of a friend, yeah. want to ask about the um, the drug of fame. Mm. So there's also the public uh, perception of the battles of physics, mm. and so there's a very narrow community. But then there's the way that's perceived, um, the exploration of ideas is perceived by the public. And so there is a cert certain drug to the excitement that the public can show when they sense that you have something big. And that in itself might become the thing that gives you pleasure. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I think that with theories of everything or with any kind of super, super ambitious projects, and this is taking us back to when you were ambitious about trying to understand the origins of the universe. If you convince yourself that you have an intuition about the origins of the universe and you have a platform like you do now where you start to communicate your intuition. It's 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 hazy, like all of science. You're still unsure, but you have a sense. I mean, perhaps you don't have that as much with it as an experimentalist because you always kind of start going, okay, how can I build oh, a yeah. device <laughs> that to to see through the through the fog? But if you're more like a theoretician who kind of works in this, in the realm of ideas, in the realm of intuitions, it's uh, it it is also a source of pleasure. You mentioned dopamine. Yeah a source of dopamine that you can communicate to others that you're really excited by the possibility of solving the deepest mysteries of the universe. Yeah. So there's some aspect to which you want to be a, a Grigory Grisha Perlman mm -hmm. and go into the hole yeah. and get the work done and shut the hell up about the, I'm um, yeah. speaking about myself, about, you know, uh, talking planning. about the dream and planning and exploring how great it will be if my intuition turns out to be correct. Yeah, that's right. If my, the the sketches I have turn out to actually build the bridge that takes us to a whole new place. As a friend of Eric's or a friend of, um, or my friend, what kind of advice do you give? What is your role? Is it to be a supporter? given that he has many critics, or is it to be in private um, a critic? Like a lot of my friends will say, hey, shut the hell up, <laughs> just get it done. Well, first of all, I wanna ask you a question I've asked him, <clears throat> and it comes from uh, Animal Farm by- uh, <laughs> my, Probably George. my favorite book, yeah. So you remember Benjamin the donkey? Yes. And he's talking to the pig. I forget the pig's name, you probably know. Anyway, the pig says to him, you got this long, lustrous, beautiful tail. You're so lucky. I got this short, curly, little squiggly thing that does jack squat. Tell me, how does it feel to have such a lustrous tail? And Benjamin says, well, the good Lord, he gave me a tail to swat away the flies. But you know what? I'd rather not have the tail if I didn't have the flies. <laughs> so I want to ask you, as I've asked Eric, is it worth it? You know, you've got these, you've got these beautiful tail, but there are Flies. I'm not saying in a negative way. I'm just saying you get unwanted distractions, dopamine, you know, it's kind of the highlight, the spotlight effect. It's obviously allowing you to do things that you could never do alone. And I think, you know, first of all, I'd love to know how you answer that because that's something I don't feel I can relate to myself. Well, this has to do with more like platform, a platform stuff. Yeah. Scale. Oh, I, um, <laughs> That has no very little effect on me. I I enjoy it. Uh, I enjoy meeting new people, but that has nothing to do with platform. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that has no effect on me. Um, do I, I'm want somebody that enjoys the act itself. Mm -hmm. So the, this conversation, the reason I'm doing this podcast with you today, is 
because that allows me to trick you into talking to me for a prolonged period of time. I don't care about platform. No. I assume nobody listens. It really doesn't matter. Yeah, and if it got it right, my my whole test of it was a good podcast. Because how do you know? Like, podcast has been around, what, 12 years? How do we know as podcasters we're doing a good job? Like, sometimes you, someone will say, that was the best interview I ever had. But that doesn't happen that often, at least for me. But if you realize that you forgot to put the SD card in that little guy and the Zoom didn't work, would you do it again? And I mm-hmm. think if you say yes to that, that was a good podcast. Yeah, exactly. That's that's exactly it. So in that in that space, yeah. Um all Give of it back. is worth it. Yeah. But but the dream, the the, the the I'm more referring to the psychological effects. Mm. Forget the platform, forget all of that. Mm. You know, I maybe shouldn't even brought up the platform because it really has to do even in your own private mind, mm. which is what I'm struggling with. I enjoy the planning, the dreaming, the early stages um, so much that um, I often don't take projects to completion. This is a psychological effect that I'm sure basically everybody, every engineer, everybody that does anything goes through. I just, uh, in this case particular, I think it it also applies. And I wonder as a friend, what is the role? So, yeah, I mean, that effect has been documented everything from, you know, planning telescopes to dieting. So there's a, there's a tiny bit of dopamine that you get visualizing how you're going to feel. You don't need to know this, but you know, you don't deal, but losing five pounds. Uh, I said, Oh, I'm going to lose five pounds and I'm going to be able to do run, you know, a minute faster. So there's a part of me when I'm planning the diet and the meals and the, and the exercise that I get a little bit of that thrill and that actually saps a little bit of my willpower to actually complete the task that will take me to that goal. Yeah. So that's a documented effect. And that happens in, um, in, in project planning and project management. It's a very, very important thing to guard against as a manager of a big project. With Eric, it's interesting because with him, uh, first of all, we, you know, we relate extremely well, you know, on a friendship level and uh, very close. He does remind me a lot of my father. And I, I've told him that, you know, just as a mathematician, as a big thinker, as, you know, a, in his case, as a father, you know, the, the father kind of figure that I didn't have in a sense, um, but that he is, he is a true lover of life. He knows he's got a huge platform. He knows he gets a lot of attention for what he does. Um, and, you know, I jokingly say, well, it's one thing, like, how do you know, Lex, that someone's an expert? So the Experts say, there's a good rule Ray Dalio writes about in principles. He says, or an expert is someone who's done something three times successfully. <laughs> like, you can do one th- something correctly once, you could do something correctly. T- it's very hard to pull off, like, three projects, three telescopes, three whatever, right? So, um, so look for, ah, it's arbitrary, it could be four, it could be two, right? But the point is, look at Eric. So how many things has he contributed to and made, you know, pretty substantive kind of uh, paradigm shifts for different people? I would say he's been right many times. Does that mean he's infallible, that he's ineffable? No, of course not. For me, so what I'm saying is I get a little bit of the joy of kind of learning something purely as a as a scientist, something completely outside of what I do, mathematics, gauge theory, um, the, the, the kind of very, um, very advanced geometry topology that he's interested in. But every now and then, I will sneak in that I want, you know, I've told him, I'm going to turn your son into an experimentalist despite you. You know, like, <laughs> he is not going to be a theorist. Yeah. Zev is not going to be a theorist. He is working with me. He is learning from me. He's, we're trying to get him into, he wants to bypass all of the, you know, the kind of nonsense of, of undergraduate and go straight to graduate school. And I've tried to encourage him that maybe he could do it, maybe he can't, but there's no other way than to try. And so we've, I've prepared a whole curriculum for Zev to basically bypass all of undergraduate. And yeah. to his credit, he he's done, earns all the credit. He's learned it to a level that matches many of my graduates. Okay, hold on a second. I have to push back, and this is me saying it, and I'll, yeah. I'm sure I'll talk to Eric about this. But to say you, you said Eric's done was right on multiple things. I think Eric has a great deep insight about human nature and how societies work, and he says a lot of wise words on that world. But I think if we're talking about experts, you kind of have to prove, you you know, it's like Michael Jordan playing baseball. (laughs) Like he's proved it many times that he can play basketball, but he's also got to prove that he can play baseball. And I would say the whole point of, I mean, of radical ideas is you're not, I mean, it's very hard to be sitting on a track record of, I mean, you're, when you're swinging for the fences always, you're, uh, there's not a track record to sit on 
And uh, like Max Tegmark is an example of somebody who has a huge track record of more like acceptable stuff, yeah. but he also keeps swinging for the fences in every other world. Right. So he has that track record. Yeah. With so, Eric, if you look at just the number of publications, all this stuff, he did really, he chose not to travel the academic route. So there's no proof of expertise except sort of an obvious uh, linguistic demonstration of brilliance. But well, that's not how yeah. physics works, So right? there's, a, there's a polite way to damn somebody as a scientist and say, he or she, she they really know the history of physics very well. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, physicists always love it. Like, Sean yeah. Carroll always jokes about it. Like, you know, like, physicists should never talk about history of physics. <laughs> um, but it's more than that. So Eric has certainly contributed in finance, and finance specifically, and gauge theory and economics and um and inflation dynamics and the non cosmological. Yet, hold on a second. That's yet to be proven. He has a lot of powerful well, gauge theory is calculus. Is calculus proven? I mean, he 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 has a gauge model for currency um for currency uh, uh, exchanges between different nations that yes. is explanatory. Not not it's not um you know is it is it is this something? In other words, it's a model and it's used for pedagogical purposes. And it might be okay. And it it's might, unique to him. It, I mean, to him and Pia. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Right. It might be a powerful model. It might be one that actually deserves a huge amount of applause and celebration, but it's not yet received that. And that's one of the things that Eric talks about. It has not received the attention it deserves. Yeah. But it has not yet received the attention it deserves. And so like the, the well, proven yeah. expertise thing, mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of people that go to their grave without the recognition they deserve. And it's a tragedy. Sure. But... The fact is, like, you you have to fight for that recognition. The tragedy happens for a reason. You can't just say this person is obviously brilliant and therefore they deserve the credit um, uh, in every single domain. It yeah. doesn't it doesn't like transfer immediately. There's nobody yeah. that's well. At least I wouldn't argue. Eric is one of the special minds in our generation. But you still have to fight the fight of physics. And prove it within the community. And I, right. I think the same applies in economics. You can't, I mean, as somebody uh, that, uh, you know, I've, I've gone through the academic journey, yeah. just like you said, the peer review, all of those things, flawed as they are, that's the part of the process. You have to convince your peers, the, um, the people that are as, as obsessed for whatever the hell reason about that particular thing that you're working on. Yes, there's egos. Yes, there's politics. It's a giant mess, but I think it's a beautiful mess through which you have to go through in order to um, reveal the power of your idea to, to yourself. You were one of the lawyers who represented the Hollywood producer Harvey Weinstein in advance of a sexual assault trial. For this, Harvard forced you to step down as faculty deans, uh, you and your wife, of Winthrop House. Can you tell the story of this saga from uh, first deciding to represent Harvey Weinstein to the interesting, complicated events that followed? Yeah, sure. So I got a call one morning from a colleague at the Harvard Law School who uh, asked if uh, I would consent to taking a call from, from Harvey. Uh, he wanted to meet me and uh, and chat with me about representing him. I said yes, and um, one thing led to another. Uh, I uh, drove out to Connecticut uh, where he was staying and met with him and some of his advisors. And then uh, a day or two later, I uh, decided to, to take the case. This would have been back in uh, January of 2019, uh, I, I believe. So the sort of cases, I, I have a very small practice. Most of my time is, is teaching and, and, and writing. Uh, but uh, I tend to take cases that most uh, deem to be uh, impossible. Uh, uh, I take the challenging sorts of cases. And, and this was um, uh, fit the bill. It was quite challenging in the sense that uh, everyone had uh, prejudged the case. When I say everyone, I just mean the, the general sentiment in the public uh, uh, had the case prejudged, uh, even though the specific allegations did not regard uh, the any of the people in the um, in the New Yorker. That's the New Yorker article that sort of uh, uh, exposed uh, everything that was going on. 
um, allegedly with, with with Harvey. So I decided to uh, to take the case, and uh, I did. Is there a philosophy behind you taking on these very difficult cases? Like, is it a set of principles? Is it just your love of the law, or is it? Of, is there like set of principles why you take on the cases? Yeah, I, I do. I take on. I like to take on hard cases, and I like to take on the cases that uh, that uh, are with unpopular uh, defendants, unpopular clients. Um, and with respect to the latter, that's where Harvey Weinstein yes. fell. Yes, uh, it's because uh, we need lawyers and good lawyers to take the unpopular cases uh, because. That those sorts of cases determine what sort of criminal justice system we have. Uh, if we don't protect the rights and the liberties of those whom the society deems to be the least and the last, the unpopular client, then that's the, the camel's nose under the tent. If we let the camel's nose under the tent, the entire tent is going to collapse. That is to say, if we short circuit the rights of a client like Harvey Weinstein, then the next thing you know, someone will be at your door knocking it down and violating your rights. There's a there's a certain creep there with respect to um, the way in which the, the state will respect the civil rights and civil liberties of people. And, and these are the sorts of cases that that, that test it. So, you know, for example, um, there's a there, there was a young man many, many years ago named Ernesto Miranda. Um, by all accounts, he was not a likable guy. He was, uh, you know, three time uh, knife thief and not a likable guy. But lawyers stepped up and took his case. And because of that, we now have the Miranda uh, warnings. You have the right to remain silent. And that those those warnings that um, officers are, are are forced to give to people. Mm -hmm. So it is through these cases that we expect oftentimes the best values in our criminal justice system. So I, I, I proudly take on these sorts of cases in order to vindicate not only the individual rights of the person whom I'm representing, but the rights of citizens writ large, uh, who um, most of whom do not experience the criminal justice system. And it's partly because of lawyers who take on these sorts of cases and establish rules that protect us, uh, average, everyday, ordinary, concrete citizens. As From a psychological perspective, just you as a human, is there, is there fear? Is there stress from all the pressure? Because if you're facing, I mean, the whole point, a difficult case, especially in the latter that you mentioned of the going against popular opinion, mm -hmm. you have the eyes of millions potentially looking at you with anger. Uh, as you try to defend, uh, you know, this, this set of laws that this country is built on? No, it doesn't stress me out particularly. <laughs> it, okay. uh, you know, it, it sort of comes with the, the territory. I try not to get uh, too excited in either direction. So a big part of my practice is uh, wrongful convictions. And I, uh, I've gotten uh, over 6,000 people out of prison who've been wrongfully incarcerated and a subset of those people have been convicted. And, you know, if people have been in jail 20, 30 uh, years who have gotten out and those are the sorts of cases where people uh, praise you and, and, and that sort of thing. And so look, I, I, I do uh, the work that I do. I'm proud of the work that I do. And in that sense, I'm, uh, Sort of a part-time Taoist. You know, the, the expression "reversal" is the movement yeah. of the Tao. Yeah. Uh, so I don't get too high. I don't get too low. Uh, I just try to do my work and, and represent people to the best of my. That is the Bitcoin rabbit hole in a nutshell. Is it? You know, they say fix the money, fix the world. You keep tracing these different um, social malaises or, or you know, technological difficulties, lack of innovation. I, you know, Weinstein's entire Portal podcast. Something went wrong in the early seventies. We went off the gold standard in 1971. And there's a great website, WTFHappen1971.com, goes through this whole gamut of socioeconomic data that's completely gone uh, askew since, since the early 70s. Yeah, you had this whole video. What do you think about Eric Weinstein and, uh, the, and Bitcoin and uh, the gold standard? And does he, I actually haven't heard him talk about his uh, thesis about the, the 70s in connection to the 
going off of the gold standard. Um, yeah, what are your thoughts there? What, what what are your thoughts about his general relationship with the with the Bitcoin idea and the community? Yeah, the first exposure I had to Eric was his, I think it was his first episode with Peter Thiel. And they're going through that thesis that there's been this general institutional rot and suppression of innovation since the early 70s. And he's trying to identify what it is. I don't think they ever pinned it on the money uh, on, on going off the gold standard. But in recent um, interactions with Eric, you know, I've interacted with him on Clubhouse. Um, we recently released an episode of the show uh, I did with Chris Espley, and it was titled Dear Eric Weinstein. So we're going through his worldview that he's expressed in the portal and tying it back to the money in, in different ways. And he's been, he's engaged. Eric uh, retweeted the show. We had, we've exchanged some messages. He's been very open-minded. He's asked some really good questions. So I get the sense that he's approaching this um, very wholeheartedly. Uh, he does bring with him his existing worldview and his existing theory. The, the one that really blew up was gauge theory. They got really popular. I don't know a lot about gauge theory. I actually messaged Eric and said, I want to learn more genuinely because um, you know, he seems to be serious that that needs to be considered in the sphere of money. And so I want to learn more about it. Um, but I Thank think you. overall it, it's great. It's great to see an intellectual heavyweight of his caliber gravitating towards Bitcoin. Yeah. He has some gauge theoretic conceptions about the world broadly, but also about economics, which ultimately boils down to just a set of mathematics, which allows you to more effectively reason about the world. And he has a certain set of views there. So it's fascinating to see him grapple with it. I think he's also kind of, actually kind of like all of us, uh, grappling with the idea of what is Bitcoin mm -hmm. in this world. It's a very young technology and it's unclear exactly how the ideas of the past fit with it. Yeah. Uh, integrate how the two integrate together. And so it's interesting to explore, uh, not just Bitcoin, the particular. So for me, like what I've always uh, saw Bitcoin as from the beginning, from a narrow worldview is computer science, which is mm -hmm. what where I come from. And so I wasn't almost aware in the uh, social, political, financial aspects of Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. But now I see that there's, not just power, but there's fascinating ideas to explore on that side of things, not just the computer science, not just the technical details, but the political, the socioeconomic, yeah. the philosophical. The philosophic, yeah, yeah. That's, that's where I you know, find all the fascination in the world, frankly. Um, I, would, I would, one other thing about uh, Weinstein and intellectuals more generally that are skeptical of Bitcoin, I would challenge them to read the book, Human Action, Written by, written by Mises, I think in 1949, he published the English version. Uh, it's essential, essentially the, the Bible of Austrian economics. And I think Austrian economics is a noticeable gap in most modern intellectuals' worldviews that it's not taught in school. I mean, I have a master's degree in accounting and finance. You know, studied a lot of economics in school. There's not one peep of Austrian that. econ. The, the least oh, yeah. <laughs> Robert love talking about all the degrees he has. <laughs> I was a CPA. All <laughs> um, but it's it that curriculum that we get in college is noticeably deficient in Austrian economics, yeah. and I think there's a reason why. Right? It's it's, it's go heavily, heavily government influenced. Um, again, master's degree in accounting. They never taught me about what money is or where money comes from. All you learn is that. The central bank issues money and the central bank takes money away. So it's it's conceived of in the textbooks quite literally as God, right? An entity that suffers no opportunity cost, that um, basically is the foundation of the entire Keynesian worldview that you're taught in economics. And Austrian economics is the opposite end of the spectrum of that, right? It's, it's actually the culmination, which economics is the youngest science in the world by the way. So it's, it is um, kind of the front, it's the frontiers of science in many ways, like to actually, you, when I say praxeology, many people have never even heard of that, but it's something, uh, it's an 
a priori study equivalent to something like mathematics, that you're building things from first principles to reason about economic reality. And I think that book, it's a very difficult book written by Mises, 1200 pages, translated from German. The way he wields English is fascinating and terrifying all at the same time. Uh, it'd probably take you six months to read it if you read it daily, seriously. Like it's a, it's a beast of a book. But that will plug the gap, I think, in most any intellectual that's skeptical about Bitcoin, I think that will plug the gap that's necessary for you to see it in, in a new light. Well, I'll take that as a challenge. Please. Let me ask a ridiculous question. Uh, you know, you talk about your favorite soccer player to bar. I I'll ask the same question about Einstein's ideas, which is, um, which one do you think is the biggest leap of genius? Is it the uh, E equals MC squared? Is it Brownian motion? Is it special relativity? Is it general relativity? Which, which uh, of, of the famous set of papers he's written in 1905 and in general his work was the biggest leap of genius? In my opinion, it's special relativity. The idea that speed of light is the same for everybody is the beginning of everything he did. The beginning is the, the seed. beginning. It's the seed. Once you embrace that yes. weirdness, the, yes. all the weirdness, yes. all the rest I, of I would say that's, that's it. Even though he says the most beautiful moment for him, yes. he says that is when he realized that if you fall in an elevator, you don't know if you're falling or whether you're in the, whether you're in the falling elevator or whether you're near, next to the earth gravitational mm. field. That, that to him was his aha moment, which inertial mass and gravitational mass being identical mm -hmm geometrically and so forth as part of the theory, not because of, uh, you know, some some uh, funny coincidence. Uh, that's for him. But I feel from outside, at least, it feels <laughs> like the speed of light being the same is the, is the really aha moment. The general relativity to you is not like a, a, a conception of space-time. In a sense, the conception of space-time already was part of special relativity when you talk about length contraction. Hmm. So general relativity takes that to the next step, but beginning of it was already space length contracts, time dilates. So once you talk about those, then yeah, you can dilate more or less different places than its curvature. So you don't have a choice. So it's kind of started uh, just with that same simple thought. Speed of light is the same for all. This, and it comes to Einstein. Einstein looks at Maxwell's equation. He says, beautiful, these are <laughs> nice equations, except we get one speed light. Yeah. Are, who, who measures this light speed? And he asks the question, are you, on, are you moving? Are you not moving? If you move, the speed of light changes, but Maxwell's equation has no hint of different speeds of light. It doesn't say, oh, only if you're not moving, you get the speed. It's just, you always get the speed. So Einstein was very puzzled and he, he was daring enough to say, well, you know, maybe everybody gets the same speed for light. Yeah. And that motivated his theory of special relativity. And this is an interesting example because the idea was motivated from physics, from Maxwell's equations, from the fact that people try to uh, tried to measure the properties of ether, which was supposed to be the medium in which the light travels through. And the idea was that only in that, in that medium, the speed is speed of, if you're at rest with respect to the ether, the speed is speed of light. And if you're moving, the speed changes. And people did not discover it. Michelson and Morley's experiment showed there is no ether. So uh, then Einstein was courageous enough to say, you know, light is the same speed for everybody, regardless of whether you're moving or not. And the interesting thing is about special theory of relativity is that the, under, the math underpinning it is very simple. It's a linear algebra, nothing terribly deep. You can teach it at a high school level, if not earlier. Okay, is, does that mean Einstein's special relativity is boring? Not at all. So this is an example where simple math, you know, linear algebra leads to deep physics. Einstein's theory of special relativity, motivated by this inconsistency at Maxwell uh, equation would suggest for the speed of light, depending on who observes it. What's the most daring idea there, that that uh, the speed of light could be the same everywhere? So that's the basic, that's the guts of it. That's the core of Einstein's theory. That statement underlies the whole thing. Speed of light is the same for everybody. It's hard to swallow and it doesn't sound right. It sounds completely wrong on the face of it. And it was it took Einstein to make to make this uh, daring statement. It would it would be it would be laughing in some sense. How could possibly how could anybody make this possibly ridiculous claim? And it turned out to be true. How does that make you feel? Because it, it it still sounds ridiculous. <laughs> it, it sounds ridiculous until you learn that our intuition is at fault about the way we conceive of space and time. The way we think about space and time is wrong, because we think about the nature of time as absolute. Yeah. And part of it is because 
we live in a situation where we don't go with very high speeds. There are speeds are small compared to the speed of light. And therefore the phenomena we, we observe does not distinguish the relativity of time. The time also depends on who measures it. There's no absolute time. When you say it's noon today now, it depends on who's measuring it and it, it, not everybody would agree with that statement. And to see that, you will have to have fast observer moving, you know, speeds close to the speed of light. So, so this shows that our intuition is at fault. And a lot of the discoveries in physics precisely is getting rid of the wrong old intuition. And it is funny because we get rid of it, but it always lingers in us in some form. Like <laughs> even when I'm describing it, I feel like a little yeah. bit like, isn't it you know, funny <laughs> as you're just feeling the same way? It is, Yes, it is, but we kind of replace it by an intuition. And actually there's a very beautiful example of this, uh, how physicists do this, try to replace their intuition. So Newton had this uh, year of miracles. I wonder if I could ask you briefly about Einstein and his year of miracles. I've been reading, I'm rereading, revisiting the brilliance of the papers that Einstein published in the year 1905 one of which won him the Nobel Prize, the photoelectric effect, but also Brownian motion, special theory of relativity, and uh, of course the uh, the old E equals MC squared. Is there, um, does that make sense to you that uh, these two figures had such productive years that th there's this moment of genius? <laughs> maybe, maybe if we zoom out, I mean, I, my, my work is very much in artificial intelligence, sort of wondering about the nature of intelligence. Like, how did we, how did evolution on Earth produce genius that uh, could come up with so much in so little time? To me, that gives me hope that one person can change the world in such um, a small amount yeah. of time. Well, of course, there are precedents for in both Newton's and Einstein's cases for elements of what we're finding there. It's, yes. you know, and so on. Well, I have no idea. You know, I'm sure you must have read, it was a kind of a famous story that um, after Einstein died, he donated his brain and they sliced it up to see if they could find something unusual there and nothing unusual visibly uh, in there. So I have, I, I it's clearly... There are people who, for various reasons, maybe both intrinsic and extrinsic in the sense of experience and so on, are capable of coming up with these extraordinary uh, results. Uh, many years ago, when I was a student, a friend of mine came in and said, did you read about, did you read this? I forget what, it, anyway, there was a story in the paper. It was about, I think it was a young woman who... Um, was she couldn't speak and she she was somewhere on the autism spectrum she could not um, read other people's affect mm -hmm. in any ways um, but she could sit down at a piano and having heard it once and then run variations on the most complex uh, pianistic works of chopin and others uh, right now, how? Some aspect of our mind is able to tune in and some aspect of reality and become a master of it. And every once in a while, that means coming up with breakthrough ideas in physics. Yep. Yeah. How the heck does that happen? <laughs> Who knows? Jed, I'd like to say thank you so much for spending your valuable time with me today. It was a really fascinating conversation. I've learned so much about Isaac Newton, who's one of the most fascinating figures in human history. So thank you so much for talking a today. A pleasure. Enjoyed it very much. Thanks for listening to this conversation with Jed Buckwald. To support this podcast, please check out our sponsors in the description. And now let me leave you with some words from Thomas Kuhn, a philosopher of science. The answers you get depend on the questions you ask. Thank you for listening and hope to see you next time. Can I ask you some weird thing about friendship? Of course. Because you mentioned 
um, Sam, he's Mr. Harris to you. Mm. Uh, <laughs> and then Joe, Didn't that bother you how he went after Joe? Oh, uh, what did, did well, he's he, like? Oh, in case you guys have brain damage from watching Rogan's last episode, like watch. Here's the answer, and it's just oh, like, like digs like that. Yeah, yeah. I didn't like that. I didn't like that either. Uh, I think Sam doesn't like it either about himself. Okay. Uh, he regrets those things. Because it's very easy to say from his perspective, look, this isn't the full side. Rogan didn't show you the full side of the story. Here's the other side of the story. Please watch this and be informed. That's a very reasonable thing to say. Yeah, I don't quite understand this. So they, they do this about each other now. Um, I'll, I'll put three people on the table, which is Joe Rogan, Sam Harris, and, and Brett Weinstein. And they have a way of talking like the other person is creating a lot of harm. Like publicly would say things like that. And I understand there's emotion in it, but like these are human beings that are friends of yours. But I'll, I'll go the other way. Let's suppose it is true that Joe is doing a lot of harm spreading misinformation. Being sarcastic isn't going to be persuasive. Whereas if you're like, he's wrong, Here's the facts, or here's or be informed that I, to me. But then I'm not Sam Harris. I'm not. A, he's got a bigger audience than me, so maybe he's the one who's right, not wrong. No, he's well. He's just human. Okay. Well, he's I can't human. relate. Well, have you seen your Twitter lately? I mean, your Twitter. You get very. You have a lot of fun on Twitter. I feel, sure. I feel like Twitter lets. I've never done that with someone I'm friends with. I never would. Okay, let's put that on record. It is on he record. Trolls me because uh, if there's an issue with you, I'm getting you on the phone. Yeah. Good. I mean, because then I'm not backing you into a corner publicly. It doesn't make any sense strategically. Yeah, and actually, um, Brett Weinstein um, tweeted something, sort of criticizing something I did. I already forgot what, but he texted me first, saying like, "Is it okay if I tweet this?" Yeah, and I, I said, "Yep." Uh, like I was excited. Yeah, but I think there's some level of just be compassionate privately and be compassionate publicly, like or both. be civil. Civil. Yeah. I, 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 for some reason, I don't like the word civility because it, it's like polite. I do, like it, it's, uh, or be cordial. Is that better? No, what I mean is like, it seems phony to you. It seems phony. Like you should radiate love in whatever yeah. way. So even if you're rough with the other person, you should still show like respect and love for that person. And that, that gets back to the Russian rooms where they're yelling at each yeah, other, yeah, but yeah. there's still love underneath it. I mean, uh, th the question I want to ask for you is, uh, I think you and I have a different view on some things. Okay. We have a different approach to things, but just on, on the surface level, but also a different view on some things. Like, I have a lot of hope for institutions. I I, I have, so uh, maybe it's a gut instinct. Like, your gut instinct is like, centers of power are like, burn them down first, and then let's figure it out. Sure. <laughs> like, or maybe that's a funny, rough way of no, saying it. No, I think it, that's but, about right. And then for, for me, it's like, no, let's understand the institution and slowly, um, revolutions from within versus okay. revolutions from without. And, um, but like, we can have those disagreements, and there may be times when those disagreements will be, I could see in the future, I could see I'll be attacked by my friend Michael Malice which I very look forward to it. Right. No, not attack, but you know what I mean, on the surface level, in the idea space. Anyway, because you're shaking your head now, you, you won't. I guess um, maybe this also goes to Sam Harris and uh, Joe Rogan. I would love to be able to disagree, disagree in big ways on important things and still be close friends. And I don't understand why those are, should be contradictions. Yeah. And that's the tension. That's been the most heartbreaking thing to me about Sam and Brett and Joe. With, in the case of Brett, it's me. I don't know Brett, so I'm just like looking as a somebody who just enjoys having these voices out there. And it seems like COVID just brought out the worst in some many folks. And it, it just feels like it's so sad to me to see their friendship s somewhat deteriorating. Or maybe I'm just being in a... Um, no, it seems clear that it's deteriorated enormously. It's um, sad, but that's the case. Yeah, so my, like I've had people come at me because I'm friends with you. And they were like, oh, Lex authored some paper about masks. I don't even know what the hell they're referring to. I don't care. Um, I always say and mean, I don't care whether someone agrees with me. I care how they treat me. Mm -hmm. And it goes the other way because I'll have a lot of people on Twitter who are like, oh, I'm on your team and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, I don't know you. You're not my team. 
And just because you happen to agree with me, it's of no value to, to me. Like, I don't know you and I'm not interested in knowing you. Mm -hmm. Many of my friends, I don't know what their politics are. I don't care. Like, I care how we hang out, we have a good time, we watch dumb movies, watch YouTube, mm -hmm. go to the store, whatever. Um, I don't know what your politics are. I don't care what your politics are. Um, um, Chris Williamson, who, you know, he's just here. He's going to be moving to Austin. I only learned what his politics are in the last, we've been, we chat like almost every day because he took the world's smallest political quiz mm -hmm. uh, and he figured out what his answers were. I had no idea. He's, where he's a communist. He's well, obviously, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Marxist. <laughs> yeah. I mean, let's be, yeah. Let's be honest. <laughs> um, so like stuff like that, like it never, and people, uh, I think because politics is often so tribal, especially now, uh, they'll be like, oh, I could never be friends with someone who voted for X. Really? What if they're like grandma worked in that campaign? What if, you know, blah, blah, blah. it's this, you can't think of one steel man argument why this would happen. What if they just want to spite their boss? Um, so I, I don't like that approach at all. It makes no sense to me. Um, it, we could still have debates. I mean, it's, it's, like I would still like to have those conversations and still have disagreements. Like uh, I, I disagree with Joe on COVID a lot on a bunch of different things, very kind of, but it's never like it's not tense at all. It's 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 just it's uh it doesn't have that arrogance that seem the COVID, right. a lot of COVID conversations seems to have, like uh, talking down to people from bo both directions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's um. So I would love to have those because I love the debate. I love debates. It takes a lot to get me triggered, and when the Babylon Bee were interviewing Elon, and he had this thing, he goes, "Well, I don't know anyone who wants to, you know." abolish the FDA and the FAA and I'm standing there <laughs> and I'm shaking and the guys look at me and they're like, oh, we actually have an anarchist here. And the example he used was, you know, look, if you're playing football, you're going to have a referee there and you want the referee, you know, you don't want, but the referee started playing the game is maybe <laughs> such a good thing. And I'm sitting there, I'm like, the referee doesn't work for the state. Yeah. The referee is a private individual working for this organization. Yeah. And there's no reason at all that food quality, which is something crucially important, has to be or can only be delivered through the state and a government monopoly. That's actually really interesting, just to link on that, just just, just, just a little bit, with the vaccine and stuff like that, with the antiviral drugs, the FDA, so like, are you comfortable, like who should be the referee? Right. Like, do you have an idea, like what's the best referee for the vaccine, is it just the market? Just well, let people decide. Th this is tricky because the thing the thing that I, I have not been following COVID as closely as yeah. Joe and, and Sam, as Mr. Harris, excuse me, and Mr. Musk. The point is when anything like this is developing, there's going to be a lot of misinformation out there, even from the scientists, because it's a dynamic process. They don't know what they're dealing with. Yeah. A lot of it has to be speculative. They don't know long-term effects because it hasn't been around for a long time. So I think it is very... Um, dangerous when, you know, when Joe was mocked for taking a laundry list of things under his doctor's advice, mm -hmm. and they kind of latched onto the, the ivermectin, and then they specifically said it was horse paste, although it's veterinary medicine, so why didn't they say mm -hmm. dog paste or cat paste? It's like, well, he's not dead. So, and he's also taking drugs which are used in other circumstances. At the very least, maybe they're pointless, but if the drug is being allowed for pharmaceutical reasons, the odds are quite low that they're going to have deleterious side effects uh, in general. So I think this kind of insistence that there has to be one A officially approved outcome that we're all doing, that is kind of dangerous thinking in general. If we could talk about maybe experimental validation and... Yes. Uh, you, you're the co-author of a recently published book, Proving Einstein Right. The the human story of it too, the daring expeditions that change how we look at the universe. Do you see echoes of the early days of general relativity in the 1910s to the more stretched out to string theory? I do, out I do. And that's one reason why I was happy to focus on uh, on the story of how Einstein became a global superstar. Um, earlier in our discussion, we went over the, 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 his history where in 1915 he, he came up with this piece of mathematics 
used it to do some calculations and then made a prediction. Yes. But making a prediction is not enough. Someone's got to go out and measure. And so string theory is in that in-between zone. Now for Einstein, it was from 1915 to 1919. 1915, he makes the, uh, makes the correct prediction. By the way, he made an incorrect prediction about the same thing in 1911, but he corrected himself in 1915. And by 1919, the first pieces of experimental observational data became available to say, yes, he's not wrong. And by 1922, the, the argument that based on observation was overwhelming that he was not wrong. Can you describe what special and general relativity are just briefly? Sure. In sense, and what prediction Einstein made? And maybe... <laughs> maybe some or a memorable moment from the the human journey of trying to prove this thing right, sure. which is incredible. Right. So I'm very fortunate to have worked with a, a, a talented novelist who wanted to write a book that coincided with a book I wanted to write about w how science kind of feels if you're a person. Because <laughs> mm. it's actually people who do science, even right. though that may not be obvious to everyone. Uh, so for me, I wanted to write this book for a couple of reasons. I wanted young people to understand that these seeming alien giants that live before them were just as human as they are. They get married, they get divorced. They get married, they get they divorced. Get... They do terrible things. They do great things. They're people. They're just yeah. people like you. And so that part of telling the story allowed me to get that out there for both young people interested in the sciences as well as the public. Yeah. But the other part of the story is I wanted to open up sort of what, what it was like. Now, I'm a scientist, and so I will not pretend to be a great writer. I understand a lot about mathematics, and I've even created my own mathematics that, you know, is kind of a weird thing to be able to do. But in order to tell the story, you really have to have uh, an incredible uh, master of the narrative and my, that was my co-author, Kathy Pelletier, who is a novelist. We, so we formed this conjoined brain, I used to call us. She used to call us Professor Higgins and Eliza Doolittle. My expression for us is that we were a conjoined brain to tell this story. And it allowed, uh, so what are some magical moments? To me, the first magical moment in telling the story was looking at Albert Einstein in his struggle. Because although we regard him as a genius, as I said, in 1911, he actually made an incorrect prediction about bending starlight. And that's actually what set the astronomers off. In 1914, there was an eclipse. And by various accidents of war and weather and all sorts of things that we talk about in the book, no one was able to make the measurement. If they had made the measurement, it would have disagreed with his 1911 prediction, because nature only has one answer. Mm -hmm. And so you then you see how fortunate he was that wars and bad weather and accidents and transporting equipment stopped any measurements from being made. So he corrects himself in 1915, and but the astronomers are already out there trying to make the measurement. So now he gives them a different number, and it turns out that's the number that nature agrees with. So it gives you a sense of this is a person struggling with something deeply. And it, although uh, his deep insight led him to this, it is the circumstance of time, place, and accident but through which we view him. And it could the story could have turned out very differently, where first he makes a prediction, the measurements are made in 1914, they disagree with his prediction, and so what would the world view him as? Well, he's this professor who made this prediction that didn't get it right. Yes? So the fragility of human history is illustrated by that story. And it's one of my favorite things. You also learn things like uh, in our book, the, how eclipses and watching eclipses was a driver of the development of science in our nation when it was very young. In fact, even before we were a nation, it turns out uh, there were uh, citizens of citizens of this uh, would-be country that were going out trying to measure eclipses. So some fortune, some misfortune. 
affects the progress of science. Absolutely. Especially with ideas as, uh, to me at least, if I put myself back in those days, as radical as general relativity is. First, can you describe, uh, if it's okay, briefly, what general relativity is? And yeah, if, if could you just take a moment of, yeah, put yourself in those shoes, uh, in the in academic researcher, scientist of that time, and what is this theory? What is it trying to describe about our world? It's trying to answer the thing that left Isaac Newton puzzled. Isaac Newton says gravity magically goes from one place to another. He doesn't believe it, by the way. He knows right. that's not right. But the mathematics is so good that you have to say, well, I'll throw my qualms away because I'll use it. That's all we used to get for, uh, a man from the Earth to the moon was that mathematics. So I'm one of those scientists, and I've seen this. And if I thought deeply about it, maybe I know that Newton himself wasn't comfortable. And so the first thing I would hope that I would feel is, gee, there's this young kid out there who has an idea to fill in this hole that was lay, left with us by Sir Isaac Newton. That would, I hope, would be my reaction. I have a suspicion. I'm, I'm kind of a mathematical creature. Mm -hmm. uh, I was four years old when I first decided that science was what I wanted to do with my life. And so if my personality back then was like it is now, uh, I think it's probably likely I would want to wanted to have studied his mathematics. Mm -hmm. What was a piece of mathematics that he was using to make this prediction? Because he didn't actually create that mathematics. That mathematics was created roughly 50 years before he lived. He's the person who harnessed it in order to, to make a prediction. In fact, he had to be taught this mathematics by a friend. Mm -hmm. So this is in our book. So putting myself in that time, I would want to, like I said, I think I would feel excitement. I would want to know what the mathematics is, and then I would want to do the calculations myself. Because one thing that physics is all about is that you don't have to take anybody's word for anything. It's You can do it yourself. It does seem that mathematics is a little bit more tolerant of radical ideas or mathematicians or people who uh, find beauty in mathematics. Why, all the why questions have no good answer, but let me ask, why do you think Einstein never got the Nobel Prize for general relativity? He got it for the photoelectric effect. That is correct. Well, the, first of all, the, that's something that is misunderstood about the Nobel Prize in physics. The Nobel Prize in physics is never given for purely giving, uh, for purely proposing an idea. It is always given for proposing an idea that has observational support. So he could not get the Nobel Prize for either special relativity nor general relativity because the provisions that Alfred Nobel left for the award prevent that. Uh, but after it's been validated, can he not get it then or no? Yes, but remember the validation doesn't really come until the 1920s. Yeah, but that's why they invented the second Nobel Prize. I mean, uh, Marie Curie, you can get a second Nobel Prize for one of the greatest so, so theories me, in physics. So right? let me, let's be clear on this. The theory of general relativity had its critics even up until the 50s. So if you had, if we had, if the committee had wanted to give the prize for general relativity. There were vociferous critics of general relativity up until the 50s. Einstein died in 1955. Yeah. What, what lessons do you draw from, from the story you tell in the book, from general relativity, from the radical nature of the theory, to, to looking at the future of string theory? Well, I think that the string theorists are probably going to retrace this path, but it's going to be far longer and more torturous, in my opinion. Uh, string theory uh, is such a, a, a broad and deep development that, in my opinion, when it becomes acceptable, it's going to be because of a confluence of observations. It's not going to be a single observation. And I have to tell you that, um, so I gave a seminar here yesterday to my team, and it's, it's on an idea I have about how string theory can leave signatures 
uh, in the cosmic microwave background, which is an astrophysical structure. And so if those kinds of observations are borne out, uh, if perhaps uh, other things related to the idea of supersymmetry are borne out, those are going to be the first powerful observationally based pieces of evidence that will begin to do what the Eddington expedition did in 1919. But who that may take several decades. Do you think there will be Nobel Prizes given for string theory? No. Because... Decades. Because I think the original, uh, because I, it'll be, it'll be, I think it will exceed normal human lifetimes. And, but there are other prizes that are given. I mean, there is something called the uh, Breakthrough Prize. Um, there's a Russian immigrant, a Russian American immigrant named Yuri M M Milner, I believe his name, started this wonderful prize uh, called the Breakthrough Prize. It's three times as much money as the Nobel Prize, and it gets awarded every year. And so something like one of those prizes is likely to be garnered at some point far earlier than a Nobel award. Uh, so just because I brought up Eric and uh, you're on Twitter, I'd love to hear your opinions. Uh, I, I talk to him a lot. He seems to have stepped into the beautiful dance of human communication and the social dynamics that is the Bitcoin cryptocurrency community. Do you have, uh, do you have thoughts on... Uh, uh, gauge theoretic concepts, conceptualization of the world is just Eric in general. He's got a lot of love in his heart and he's got grace in the way he communicates, <laughs> but he's also uh, loves to play with ideas and seems to have touched a sensitive point with the Bitcoin community. Is there anything you could say uh, that's hopeful, inspiring about that whole dynamic that went down? I, so I, I don't know all of the details, um, but what I will say is uh, I've listened to a number of his podcasts um, and him and there's a whole bunch of people like him. I basically put them in the bucket of they're an independent thinker who are courageous enough to speak their truth, whatever that may be. Uh, they are humble enough to uh, revisit their ideas and say, I got this right, I got this wrong, information changed, I'll change my mind. It's obviously a sign of intelligence to be able to do that type of stuff. And I actually think that one of the most scarce things in our society are those independent thinkers <laughs> who are able to do yeah. all this, <laughs> right? Yeah. Speaking and, of scarcity, yeah. And, and so to me, uh, I put Eric and the whole host of other people kind of, uh, if you look at like the intellectual dark web is kind of a, a label that's uh, been used they're actually some of the most important people in our society because they're the people who are willing to stand up against the mass kind of um, thought process. They're willing to uh, talk about things that others may think are taboo, right? They're willing to uh, change their mind, which all of a sudden has become a bad thing rather than a good thing. And so when I see the exploration of ideas in public, I actually think that those are the people who are most open yeah. to the kind of vehement blowback as well. Mm -hmm. Right. Because that's part of what they're doing is that they're eliciting, hey, I'm going to throw an idea into the arena. If it doesn't get attacked, they actually may be more nervous than if there is some level of, you know, kind of war of attrition, if you will. And so what I've seen with a number of the people who have done this, everyone from uh, some of the best you know, hedge fund managers and kind of money managers in the world, all the way to what I'll consider some of the most uh, intellectual people in the world is they play with these ideas and they play with the ideas and they play with them and they play with them mm -hmm. and they all arrive at the same conclusion. And sometimes it takes a month, sometimes it takes years, but they arrive at this Bitcoin thesis. And what's so interesting about it is it highlights something that uh, many people view as a bug, but I think people in the Bitcoin community view as a feature, which is that community. And so what ends up happening is when you have something that is as ambitious as creating a global reserve currency. Doesn't mean it needs to unseat any of the existing ones, but become the global reserve currency of the internet, right? This digital economy. You need shepherds of it. Mm -hmm. And so just like a technology company wants to find those loyal fans that are willing to go out and market and word of mouth and, and kind of not only uh, promote it, but also uh, protect it, this technology that is this decentralized thing, which uses a financial incentive in order to elicit the buy-in, uh, not from a financial perspective, but from a mental energy standpoint, has built one of the most rabid, powerful, and engaged communities on the internet. Mm -hmm. And what ends up happening is those people have thought more about these ideas and actually challenged those ideas more than anyone else in the world. 
And so I've got a lot of folks who will just say, um, there's this guy, Marty Bent, who will talk all the time about the Bitcoin critics haven't done their homework in a lot of cases. Mm -hmm. So they show up and sometimes it's super intellectual, lazy arguments. Sometimes it's actually very well thought out arguments, you know, on, on the counter to the Bitcoin thesis. But ultimately what ends up happening is you're talking to somebody who's an expert. They've been thinking about this for five, seven, eight, 10 years, right? They've gone through every simulation you possibly can. And they show up with data examples um, and responses. Now, they're not always right, but they've just done the work. And so what I actually uh, like about folks like Eric and others is as they're kind of going through this journey, they're incredibly smart, right? And they provide uh, or, or they um, apply a lot of intellectual rigor mm -hmm. to some of these arguments. And so what it does is, what does it do? It's a marketplace. It keeps people honest. Yeah. <laughs> right? So I, uh, let me sort of make a few comments. It's kind of interesting. Uh, so you're exactly right. Uh, maybe the blowback is part of the mechanism that actually develops these ideas and so on. I do want to kind of speak to a little bit of the toxicity that I've experienced in the Bitcoin community. I kind of see it, the Bitcoin community, I think you paint a really nice picture, which I kind of see it as an immune system <laughs> that protects against sort of... Uh, the viruses that are bad ideas. Uh, that said, the immune system can destroy a body, right? Uh, and uh, the thing you mentioned about Eric and maybe about myself uh, and in general, just people exploring ideas is there is a Dunning-Kruger effect, which is when you first start exploring ideas deeply, you have um, a overblown level of confidence about like how much you understand. And that's actually the process about learning, then you realize you don't understand much. What I've noticed with the Bitcoin community is uh, they're not as uh, patient with the, the basics of the Dunning-Kruger effect. Like if I step in and make declarative statements about Bitcoin, like I, you know, I read <laughs> a long time ago, uh, the white paper, like at the cursory level, I felt uh, that I understand the technology, so the basic intuitions, you know, I didn't, I didn't think about the social dynamics. I didn't think about any like financial implications and a lot of the deep, actually the ongoing innovations and all that kind of stuff. But I thought I understood that technology. And so I step in and make declarative statements. I think those are the, the first time you say, okay, what's the role of Bitcoin in the world? You start thinking about it deeply and then you make statements. The toxicity that you get in those first few statements is really off-putting to me. I'm somebody that tries to communicate love and live that with everything I do. And uh, there is a level of disrespect that I've experienced, not directly, just observing others. People have been mostly kind to me and I appreciate that. But if you're going to criticize me about my exploration of ideas in Bitcoin, you have to also acknowledge that I'm a human being that got like a PhD in stuff like I did some hard shit of, that it could be in farming or it could be in whatever. Like I've lived life and I really thought deeply and I really care. Like I know a lot of shit and it's possible that I actually have a lot of ideas that you can learn from. Now, if it's agriculture, fine. Or if it's artificial intelligence, fine. Like I know what I'm talking about, about certain things. And I could be wrong about a lot of things. And there's like an exchange of ideas that's, that makes the that mechanism that you talked about um, more efficient. Sometimes when the blowback is too strong too early on, the development of ideas is just inefficient. And I'm not sure if if there's a, you know, the way it was explained to me is that for so long, that community was like bombarded with just like bad ideas, like criticisms. They're just overly sensitive now to like, to bullshit, to st they're like triggered by statements. Like th they've heard it all before and they're like, oh, there they go again with the same old arguments. But that doesn't mean that, um, you know, you have to sort of, I guess, develop patience and so on, especially when you feel like in my case that the person is coming from a good place, right? Yeah. I don't know if there's something you could say yeah, well, that's positive about the future of this kind of overcoming this toxicity. I think there's a couple of trends that are all kind of coalescing here, right, in, in these types of experiences. So one is uh, when you look at a community, there's always um, a spectrum, right, in terms of, right. of there's some people who over-index on kindness uh, and stupidity, yeah. right? And there's some people who over-index on intelligence and uh, basically just being an asshole, yes. right? And, and then you get everyone in between. And so, like, uh, naturally, as we know, the extremist ends of uh, any community end up being the loudest usually, yeah. right? 
The second thing is um, there is from the outsider view, uh, like in, at the beginning of the exploration of ideas, uh, it's very much a learning process, right? It's, it, it's, I don't know if I understand this or not, but here's ideas A, B, and C. From the internal perspective, there's a trillion dollars of value at stake and we must protect it with our lives, Yeah, right? The truth is probably somewhere in between there, right? And, and again, the world's not black and white. There's, there's this kind of more gray area that I think actually um, is where most people exist. Mm. The other thing that's at play here is uh, I think the Bitcoin community understands the internet and internet culture and uh, narratives better than almost anyone. Yes. And so you see this with kind of the uh the just complete destruction uh of narratives with memes and and um just the the visceral reaction and the use of things like Reddit and Twitter and uh YouTube uh, podcast just areas where um I think a lot about uh if you are an upstart, right? And you are going to go challenge the most uh well-respected elite uh kind of establishment institutions in the world. If you walk in in a suit and tie and you say, I'm here to debate you with ideas, mm -hmm. you're going to get your clock cleaned, <laughs> yeah. right? Because they're going to trot out their yeah. lawyers, their regulators, their lobbyists, right? Like all, all this stuff. If you instead say, I'm going to meme you to death on the internet yeah. and I'm going to control the public narrative. Uh, you, you've shifted the the power, the asymmetry of power is more symmetrical now. It's the ultimate insurgency, yeah. <laughs> right? If you bring it back to the, 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 the battlefield. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and so when, when you think about this, you have to lean into the advantage that you have. Yeah. And so what ends up happening is you, you and I would absolutely lose it if we saw JP Morgan or Goldman Sachs with the Federal Reserve start tweeting memes, yeah. right? It, it, it would almost, the the validation it would give to the medium and the uh, even playing field that it would provide would pull these establishments down to the level of what is this upstart? Mm. But now what you're starting to see is that the Bitcoin community, even though there's some level of toxi uh, toxicity at times, even though there's this visceral reaction, sometimes there's even uh, what I would call um, bullying or or uh, or kind of outward projection of things, right? Mm -hmm. Even though it may be a small percentage, it'll happen every once in a while. What they do understand though is that these establishments are made up of humans. And what you can actually do, one of the best ways to pick apart an institution is to recruit from inside of them one by one. <laughs> yes. And so what you're starting to see now is, I mean, I, I get the messages on Twitter and LinkedIn all the time. Yeah. Hey, I'm a banker by trade, but I'm a <laughs> Bitcoiner at heart, yeah. <laughs> right? And so what you're doing is you're essentially infiltrating the organizations, not in in physical, uh, you know, uh, population, yeah, but with the ideas and with the philosophies. Banker in the streets, Bitcoiner in the sheets. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I like it. Uh, with that said, uh, in terms of shit posting and memes, I got to say, um, uh, like, bring it on because uh, I believe, um, in terms of asymmetry of power, I believe in that love will save the world, not memes, uh, or at least uh, good good vibe memes as opposed to shit posting. It's a it's an interesting battleground though. It's an interesting battleground to think about. The, the other thing I would say too is um, one of the elements uh, that's always kind of funny to me is how much of the entertainment is love, right? So when you start to think about how many of the memes that are posted, for example, are for outsiders versus insiders. Yes. Laser eyes, right? Which seems absolutely ridiculous, elementary, and and uh, frankly, uh, beneath anyone in any level of power or influence yeah. in the world. Somehow has congressmen and senators who have done it. Yeah, They're not trying to uh, convince their colleagues in uh, elected positions to become Bitcoiners. Yeah. They're speaking directly internally to the Bitcoin community. Yeah, there's some sense in which, yes, memes is love. Even <laughs> I keep hearing Bitcoin is love. <laughs> They're trying to convert me. Uh. <laughs> the, the one that you the, the you uh, you have to laugh at, right? Yeah. Probably my favorite one out of all of it is I've seen on multiple occasions. Uh, you know, Mark Cuban a couple of years ago, uh, Kevin O'Leary, whoever you know, wealthy people, billionaires, etc. And you have people on anonymous accounts who who knows who they are, yeah. telling them have fun staying poor, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. and it's just you know, it, it, it's just 
I, again, part of a community, and I think it, it's a, it's a feature, not a bug. There's bad aspects to it at yeah. times, but I do think it's a net positive. Yeah, just like know. the immune system. <laughs> That's all it it does. does a lot of crappy stuff, but overall, it's a, it's a major net positive. I, I wonder if you might be able to comment. So your dad does happen to be somebody who boldly seeks this kind of um, deep understanding of physics the underlying nature of reality from a physics perspective, from a mathematical physics perspective. Uh, do you have hope your dad figures it out? I have great hope. You know, it's not it's not supposed to be my journey. It's supposed to be his journey. It's supposed to be his to uh, express to the world. Obviously, I'm I'm so proud that I'm connected to someone who is determined to do such a thing. And on the other hand, uh, you know, maybe in, in some sense, I, I feel bad for him for having to, if he's going to be the the thing which which discovers some sort of grand unified theory and expresses it, I feel sorry that he will have to, to smudge um, whatever <laughs> canvas this thing is. Because, <laughs> because he's human. <laughs> really, I think... I know uh, I've seen a little bit of what I think great math and great physics looks like, and it's it's unbelievably beautiful. And then you have to present it to a world with you know like market constraints and all of this like messy sloppiness. I feel bad um, in some sense for my dad uh, because he has to go back and forth between this beautiful world of math and whatever the the messiness is of his, you know, his human life. And then the scientific community broadly with egos and tensions and just exactly. the, the dynamics of our, of what makes us uh, human. He's yeah. also very lucky that he gets to play with these sorts of things. It's, it's a mixed, it's a mixed bag. Uh, I both feel a little sorry for him for having to deal with the beauty as well as the, uh, the smudging and the, the sloppiness of, human expression and i think it's difficult not to envy such a um such a beautiful insight or life or or, or vision so well that's your own path as well as this kind of struggle of uh, as you mentioned exploring the beauty of different ideas mm -hmm. while having to communicate those ideas w with the best smudges you can uh, in a world that wants to put labels, that wants to misinterpret, that wants to uh, that wants to destroy the beauty of those ideas, and that's you seem to at this time with your youthful enthusiasm, uh, embracing that struggle uh, despite the fear in the face of fear. So, and uh, your dad also carries that same youthful enthusiasm as well. But that said, you know your dad, Eric Weinstein. He's a powerful voice, I would say, a powerful mm -hmm. intellect in public discourse. Is this a burden for you or an inspiration or both as a young mind yourself? I think, as I said, there's this, this, there's this weird contrast of, um, you know, I know that he has ideas, which I think are, are very beautiful. And I know he has to deal with um, the sort of... Uh, there's there's something you you have to sacrifice in beauty uh, when when you bring it to a world which is not always um, beautiful, um, and there's there's an aspect of that which sort of scares me about uh, this kind of thing. I also think that um, especially since I'm trying to think about how I should appear publicly, my dad has been very inspirational in that I think he's he brings a sort of fastidious care to very difficult conversations that what does fastidious mean? Um like it's just very careful okay. and um thoughtful. Um he brings that sort of attitude to um I think really difficult conversations and I know that I don't have that skill yet. I don't think I'm terrible. But so the care, the nuance, and yet not being afraid to push forward. Yeah, I would really like to to learn from my dad there. I think also my dad has been very important uh, to my life, 
just because I've always been a, a sort of very idiosyncratic thinker. Um, and I think I don't always know how to interact with the world for those sorts of reasons. And I think my dad has always been similar. And if not for my dad, I don't know if I would just believe that like I, I was stupid or something. Mm. Um, because I wouldn't know how to, how to, I don't know if I would know how to interpret uh, my differences from convention. So, so he gave you, he gave you the power to be different and use that as a superpower. Yeah, I, I guess you could, you could put it that way. I don't know who I would believe I am if uh, I didn't have my dad telling me that it wasn't my own stupidity, which alienated me from certain aspects of uh, standard life. So I'm very, very thankful for that. Is there a fond memory you have about an interaction with your dad, either funny, profound, that kind of sticks with you now? <laughs> a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Part, part of the reason I asked that, of course, it's just fascinating to uh, see somebody as brilliant as you, see how you're, the people that you interact with, how they form the mind that you have, but also to give an insight of another public uh, figure like your dad to see from your perspective of um, what kind of little magical moments happen in private life. I would say, I remember, I think I just, posted about this on, on Instagram or something. I <laughs> Otherwise it didn't happen if, if you didn't post that, yeah. One person who's always sort of mattered to whatever weird life and experience I've had has been this this comedian, Tom Lehrer. Mm -hmm. um, do, you, do you know him? Yes, yeah. He's, uh, I love him very much. Likewise. Um, anyway, I remember, I think I was five or something. My dad came home with the, with the CD this Tom Lehrer CD and he told me to to listen to it. And it was all of this like bizarre uh, satirical writing about, you know, like prostitution and mm -hmm. you know, cutting up babies and like all kinds of like ridiculously vile um, content for a, for a five-year-old. I think beyond just my love of, of Tom Lehrer, I think it was, a way for my dad to express that from a very young age, he was, uh, he was really ready to treat me like an adult and he was ready to, to trust me and share, um, share his, his life and his, uh, enjoyments with me, um, in a way that was unconventional because he was willing to, uh, discard tradition for the chance at a really uh, unique and meaningful uh, parental relationship. So trusting that the, his particular brand of weirdness is something you can understand at a young age and embrace and learn from it. Tom Lair, we should clarify, is not all about, what is it, murder and prostitution. He's one of the wittiest, most brilliant musical right. artists. If, if you haven't listened uh, to his work, you should. He's just uh, a rare, intellect who's able to sort of in catchy rhyme express some really difficult ideas and sat through satire i suppose uh, that, will, that still even though it's decades ago still resonates today some of the ideas that he expressed i will say also that um i think i am probably uh a a more cultured person having listened to tom lehrer than i would have been without i think a lot of his comedy uh draws upon a canon that I was really driven to to research by saying, "Oh, well, what does this mean? I don't I don't understand that reference." There are a lot of references there to um, really, really inspirational things, which he sort of assumes going into a lot of his songs. And for many of us, like like me, you have to piece those things together. You know, looking at, at Wikipedia pages and whatnot. But um, to tie this back to the original question, I think um, I think there's sort of a a break it, you bought it notion of parenting. I think, uh, really, if you're, if you're not going to accept a, a standard, um, you have to invent your own. And I think in some ways that was my dad's way of telling me that 
if I was too unstandard as a child, he wouldn't, he would invent his own way of parenting me because that was worth it to him. And I think that was very meaningful to me. I know you're young. This is a weird time to ask this question. Uh, are you cognizant on the role of love in your relationship with your dad? Are you at a place uh, mentally as a man yourself uh, to admit that you love the guy? I love my dad like I, uh, with the connection that I think I've had to very few things in the world. I think my dad is one of the people that's allowed me to see myself and I don't know uh, who I would imagine myself to be if not for my dad. That isn't to say that I agree with him on everything, but I think he's given me courage to accept myself and to believe that I can uh, teach myself where I'm unable to to learn from convention. So I have a very, <laughs> I love my dad very dearly, yes. Is there ways in which you wish you could be a better son? Firstly, I'd like to say I'm sure before I, I figure out exactly what those are. I think if I, I think whenever I come to conclusions on what that means, I'm, I'm eager to uh, to take them. Um, what do you mean by that? Uh, what, what, what do you mean by conclusions? If I have an idea for how to be a better son, I think I'm I'm inclined to to try to be that person. I think that's true of almost anything. I think if I have uh, ideas for improvement, it would be wasteful not to not to not to act on them. So. Um, I suppose one thing I could say is that um, I think idealism and what could almost be considered naivete is not necessarily a um, a lacking of maturity, but instead an obligation to those older than us who have lived lived and seen too much um, to fully believe uh, in what is naive and right without um, without the assistance of the young to re-inspire uh, traditional idealism. And so perhaps, instead of trying to be uh, more mature uh, all the time, I should spend some time trying to be uh, an idealistic form of hope in the lives of people who maybe have seen too much to retain all of that original hope. So uh, that's something that's, that's difficult, but you know, especially appearing in public as someone as, as young as I am, uh, I think anything I do, which is juvenile by choice, will be held against me. So, but maybe that's a sacrifice that I, I have to make. I have to retain some sort of youthful hope and optimism. Yeah, I can't. I mean, uh, I'm going to get teary-eyed. No, but uh, I have allergies. <laughs> but also, this is pretty powerful what you're saying. I certainly share your ideas. It's something I st struggle with. I've just by instinct, you should read The Idiot by Dostoevsky. By instinct, um, I love being naive and uh, seeing the world from a hopeful perspective, from an optimistic perspective. And it is, it's sad that that is something you pay a price for in this world. Like in the academic world, especially as you're coming up uh, through through schooling, but just actually it's a hit on your reputation throughout your life. And it's a sad truth, but you have to like, for many things, if it's a principle you hold, you have to be willing to pay the costs. And ultimately, I believe that in part, a hopeful view will help you realize the best version of yourself because optimism is a kind of, um, optimism is productive. <laughs> like uh, believing that the world is and can be amazing is um allows you to create a more amazing world somehow i mean i'm not sure if uh, i'm not sure if it's a human nature or a fundamental law of physics i don't know but uh, -huh. uh believing the impossible in the sense being optimistic about 
the thing it's 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 similar like going back to what you've said is like believing that a radical that a powerful single idea that a single individual can uh revolutionize some framework that we're operating in that will change the world for the better believing that allows you to have the chance to create that and so i'm i'm with you on the optimism but mm -hmm. it's a, you may have to pay a cost of optimism and uh naive hopefulness and i mean in world. some sense optimism limits freedom uh i think if we don't really have much choice in choosing what is perfect if it exists as as an ideal um then there isn't much room for for creativity and that's a danger of optimism as someone who uh would like to be creative i think i think it was warren zevon said uh accepting dreams you're never really free and that's something i i think about a lot um he's an interesting guy also i really like him <laughs> on a human level Question is, on the topic of suffering and growth, is happiness a healthy pursuit? Or do you agree with Einstein's view on happiness <laughs> as the aspiration of a pig? Okay, let me quickly look up the Einstein quote here that you reference about a pig and happiness. Okay, Einstein writes, I have never looked upon ease and happiness as ends in themselves. This critical basis I call the ideal of a pigsty. The ideals that have lighted my way and time after time have given me new courage to face life cheerfully have been kindness, beauty, and truth. Without the sense of kinship with men of like mind, without the occupation with the objective world, the eternally unattainable in the field of art and scientific endeavors, life would have seemed empty to me the trite objects of human efforts, possessions, outward success, luxury, have always seemed to me contemptible. <laughs> okay, where do I start with this? I think I usually agree with Einstein, especially when he talks philosophy on most things, and I do here as well, in terms of material possessions and all those kinds of things. But I think he unfairly attacks the word happiness and also pigs. So let me uh, disagree with Einstein and try to defend the word happiness and also maybe defend pigs, if I can somehow figure that out. So the word happiness, I think is one of those words that could mean a lot of things to a lot of people. And I think in this case, Einstein is using it as almost, uh, uh, or the pursuit of happiness as a kind of s synonym for hedonism. So kind of very narrow definition of what happiness is. I think I see happiness as a indicator that it's much bigger than, uh, than direct pleasures, but as a word that includes those pleasures, but also includes more meaningful, deep fulfillment in life. And so I'd like to reclaim the word happiness as a good thing, which is slightly applied in this discussion that happiness is a kind of... Uh, distraction that shouldn't be thought about. I do think that happiness is a side effect of a life well lived, not a goal. I think the moment it becomes a goal in itself, I think it's easy to lose your way. And perhaps that's what in part Einstein means. But I do think it's a really good signal of progress, happiness. So in, um, losing yourself in the focus of battle, of just focusing on excellence and progress and improving and challenging yourself and growing all the time. I think a kind of running average measure of your happiness, day-to-day -day happiness, so you like average that over a period of weeks and months, is a good measure of how you're doing. And I think a more like actionable process of collecting that signal is the process of just gratitude, of sitting back and thinking how grateful I am, how grateful you are for uh, for how it started and how it's going, <laughs> for the progress uh, that you've made. So I do think it's a good signal, not momentary happiness, but over a period of time, several weeks, several months, if there's not happiness, 
that you've probably lost your way as well. So it's a useful signal, not a goal in itself, but a useful signal. And, you know, kindness, beauty, and truth, as Einstein puts it, are good ideals, but they're a bit ambiguous in a um, practical day-to-day -day sense. I, I share them, of course, but I think practically, if I were to put it into words, at least for myself, struggle is the process and uh, happiness is the measure. So day-to-day -day life actually looks like a constant struggle to improve yourself. And then the flip side of that is the gratitude of how amazing life is, the progress you've made, but also just the opportunity to struggle. As, uh, you know, you have to imagine Sisyphus happy. And uh, ultimately, when I look back at my life, most days are spent truly happy to be alive. So in that sense, the pursuit of happiness is a good one. So not hedonistic in the moment, local optima of kind of pleasure, but more like stepping back, looking at the running average over the past few weeks and months and making sure you're at a good level. <laughs> So that's a bit of a disagreement with uh, Einstein. And I also have to say that I think pigs are one of the most intelligent animals. So I'm still holding out for the possibility that uh, pigs or maybe dolphins have uh, life figured out quite a bit better than us humans. So on those two things, the pursuit of happiness and on the brilliance of pigs, me and Einstein part ways for... Uh, yeah. There are things which are right there in front of us, which we miss. And I'll quote my friend Eric Weinstein in saying, look, Einstein carried his luggage, Freud carried his luggage, Marx carried his luggage, Martha Graham carried her luggage, etc. Edison carried his luggage. All these geniuses carried their luggage. And not once before relatively recently did it occur to anybody to put a wheel on luggage and pull it. <laughs> and it was right there waiting to be invented for centuries. <laughs> so this is Eric Weinstein. Yeah. What do the wheels represent? Are you basically saying that there's stuff right in front of our eyes that once we, it just clicks, we put the wheels in the luggage, a lot of things will fall into place. Yes, that I do, I do. And every day I wake up and think, why can't I be that guy who was walking through the airport? Yeah. What do you think it takes to be that guy? Because like Ooh. you said, a lot of really smart people carried their luggage. Mm -hmm. What, just psychologically speaking, so Eric Weinstein is a good example of a person who thinks outside the box. Yes. Who uh, resists almost conventional thinking. Uh, you're an example of a person who, by habit, by psychology, by upbringing, I don't know, but resists conventional thinking as well, just by nature. Thank you. That's a compliment. That's a compliment? Good. So what do you think it takes to do that? Is that something you were just born with? I doubt it. Well, I, from my studying some cases, because I'm curious about that, obviously, and just in a more concrete way, when I started out in physics, because I started a long way from physics, so it took me a long, uh, not a long time, but a lot of work to get to study it and get into it. So I did wonder about that. And so I read the biographies, and in fact, I started with the autobiography of Einstein and Newton and Galileo and all those, all those people. And I think there's a couple of things. Some of it is luck, being in the right place at the right time. Some of it is stubbornness and arrogance, which can easily go wrong. Yes. And I know, I know all of these are doorways. If you go through them slightly at the wrong speed or in yeah. the wrong angle, they're, um, they're ways to fail. But if you somehow have the right luck, the right confidence or arrogance, caring. I think Einstein 
care to understand nature with a ferocity and a commitment that exceeded other people of his time. So he asked more stubborn questions. He asked deeper questions. Um, I think, and there's a level of ability and whether ability is born in or can be developed to the extent to which it can be developed, like any of these things, like musical talent. Um, so you mentioned but, ego. What's the role of ego in that process? Confidence. Confidence. But do you, in your own life, have you found yourself walking that nice edge of too much or too little? So being too overconfident and therefore leading yourself astray or not sufficiently confident to throw away the conventional thinking of whatever the theory of the day of, of theoretical physics? I don't know if I, I mean, I've contributed what I've contributed, whether if I had had more confidence in something, I would have gotten further, yeah. I don't know. Um, well, certainly I, I'm sitting here at this moment with very much my own approach to nearly everything. <laughs> And I'm calm, I'm happy about that. But on the other hand, I know people whose self-confidence vastly exceeds mine, and sometimes I think it's justified, and sometimes I think it's not justified. I don't know if you've been paying attention to this. There's a guy named Brett Weinstein, there's a guy named Sam Harris. Mm -hmm. they, they have good representation, <laughs> I would say, of uh, of two sides of a perspective on vaccines. So from Sam Harris's perspective, it's obvious that everybody should uh, get vaccinated and it's irresponsible to not get vaccinated. I think he represents a lot of people's belief in that. And then uh, Brett is t talks a lot about ivermectin, but also talks about uh, a hesitancy towards the vaccine for for people who are healthy, who are people who are younger, that kind of thing. And uh, saying we should consider long-term effects of uh, the vaccine in making this calculation. What do you make about this conversation? Some of it happens on Twitter. <laughs> some of it happens in the space of podcasts. Um, do you pay attention to this kind of thing? What's your role in this? What, what do you hope is the way to resolve this conversation? Do you think it's healthy? Well, a conversation is always healthy, but to make definitive statements is not because it suggests you have information that you don't have. So, um, you know, we talked about long-term effects. I think you need to balance those versus long-term effects of the disease and you can make your decision. I don't think you need to tell everybody to get vaccinated. I think you need to present the case. You say, here, we made good vaccines. Here are the safety profile. Here's the risk benefit balance, and you should decide. You're a smart person. You should decide. Um, now, companies are going to do differently, right? Companies may say, you have to be vaccinated to work here. My employer, Columbia, said, we have to be vaccinated to work in the fall. And if you want to be a student, you have to be vaccinated. So you decide whether you want to go or not. But the, the idea that um, you should make a decision based on long-term effects there is no evidence, right? So how can you make a decision when we don't have evidence, whereas we do have evidence that there are long-term effects of getting COVID? So I don't think that's a fair argument, and it just makes people scared to say that. Yeah. But on the other hand, for someone to say it's a no-brainer and to denigrate people for not being vaccinated, that's not the approach either because they're going to dig in and yeah. say, I'm not doing this because you tell me to, right? I think the middle ground is to say, take a bit of both, and say, here are the potential issues, and here are the benefits, and this is what I would do, and you have to just decide on your own. I'd leave it to them. I say, you decide, and if you don't want to, you know, it's up to you. You don't have to get vaccinated. And you'll probably get infected at some point, and maybe you'll be okay. <laughs> but here's the best available data, and it looks like the vaccines are pretty, uh, a pretty damn smart solution. They seem to work. I think you tell people what you did, Right. And present both sides calmly, and I think digging in, you know, as a, like in a debate, I don't think that's terribly useful. Yeah. So that's my view. I, ch I mean, people come to me all the time and ask me, 
wh- I'm worried. What should I do? And I say, what are you worried about? Let's talk about it and go through it calmly. And if they want to still take ivermectin, I say, it's fine. It's your choice. Mm-hmm. And I have a problem with that. I love that. I, I love that's the way you think. But back to Eric, because you, you had a wonderful conversation. In that conversation, he played the big brother role. And he was very sure happy did. about it. <laughs> <laughs> he was self-congratulatory about it. I mean, can you talk to the ways in which Eric made you a better man throughout your life? Yeah, hell yeah. I mean, for one thing, you know, Eric and I are interestingly similar in some ways and radically different in some other ways. And, it, you know, it's, it's often a matter of fascination to people who know us both because almost always people meet one of us first and they sort of get used to that thing and then they meet the other and it throws the model into chaos. But, you know, I had a great advantage, which is I came second, right? <laughs> so although it was kind of a pain in the ass to be born into a world that had Eric in it because he's a force of nature, right? It was also terrifically useful because A, he was a very awesome older brother who, you know, made interesting mistakes, learned from them and conveyed the wisdom of what he had discovered. And that was, uh, you know, I, I don't know who else ends up so lucky as to have that kind of person blazing the trail. It also probably, you know, my my hypothesis for what birth order effects are is that they're actually adaptive, right? That the reason that a second born is different than a first born is that they're not born into a world with the same niches in it, right? And so the thing about Eric is he's been completely dominant in the realm of fundamental thinking, right? Like what he's fascinated by is the fundamental of fundamentals. And he's excellent at it, which meant that I was born into a world where somebody was becoming excellent in that. And for me to be anywhere near the fundamental of fundamentals was going to be pointless, right? I was gonna be playing second fiddle forever. And I think that that actually drove me to the other end of the continuum between fundamental and emergent. And so I became fascinated with biology and have been since I was three years old, right? I think Eric drove that and I have to thank him for it because, you know, I mean. Oh, I never thought of, you, so Eric drives towards the fundamental and you drive towards the emergent, the physics and the biology. Right, opposite ends of the continuum. And as Eric would be quick to point out if he was sitting here, I treat the emergent layer, I seek the fundamentals in it, which is sort of an echo of Eric's style of thinking, but applied to the the very far complexity. He's uh, overpoweringly argues for the importance of physics, the fundamental of the fundamental. He's not here to defend himself. Is there an argument to be made against that or biology the emergent, the study of the thing that emerged when the fundamental acts at the universal, at the cosmic scale and then builds the, the beautiful thing that is us is much more important. Like uh, uh, psychology, biology, the systems that we're actually interacting with in this human world are much more important to understand than um, low level uh, theories of uh, quantum mechanics and general relativity. Yeah, I can't say that one is more important. I think there's probably a different time scale. I think understanding the emergent layer is more often useful, but the bang for the buck at the far fundamental layer may be much greater. So for example, the fourth frontier, I'm pretty sure it's gonna have to be fusion powered. I don't think anything else will do it. But once you had fusion power, assuming we didn't just dump fusion power on the market the way we would be likely to if it was invented usefully tomorrow. Um, But if we had fusion power and we had a little bit more wisdom than we have, you could do an awful lot. And that's not gonna come from people like me who, you know, look at the dynamics of- Can Can I argue against that? Please. I think the way to uh, unlock fusion power is through artificial intelligence. Is So I think most of the breakthrough ideas in the futures of science will be developed by AI systems. And I think in order to build intelligent AI systems, you have to be a scholar of the fundamental of the emergent, of biology, 
of the neuroscience, of the way the brain works, of intelligence, of consciousness. And those things, at least directly, don't have anything to do with physics. Well, you're making me a little bit sad because my addiction to the aha moment thing is incompatible with, you know, uh, outsourcing that job. I don't, like to, to outsource the, I don't want to outsource that thing to <laughs> the AI. <laughs> um, you know, and actually I've seen this happen before because some of the people who uh, trained Heather and me were phylogenetic systematists, uh, Arnold Kluge in particular. And the problem with systematics is that to do it right when your technology is primitive, you have to be deeply embedded in the philosophical and the logical, right? Your method has to be based in the highest level of rigor. Once you can sequence genes, genes can spit so much data at you that you can overwhelm high quality work with just lots and lots and lots of automated work. And so in any, in some sense, there's like a generation of phylogenetic systematists who are the last of the greats because what's replacing them is sequencers. Um, so anyway, I, maybe you're right about the AI, and I guess that I'm- makes you sad. I, I like figuring stuff out. Is there something that you disagree with Eric on that you've been trying to convince him, and you failed so far, but uh, you will eventually succeed? You know, that is a very long list. Eric and I have, <laughs> have uh, tensions over certain things that recur all the time. <laughs> and I'm trying to think what would be, you know, the ideal. Is it in the space of science, in the space of philosophy, politics, family, love, robots? Well, all right, let me, uh, I'm just gonna use your podcast to uh, make a bit of cryptic war and just okay. say there yeah. are many places in which I believe <laughs> that I have butted heads with Eric over the course of decades and I have seen him move in my direction substantially over so you've time. you've been winning. He might he might win a battle here or there, but you've been winning the war. I would not say that. It's quite possible he could say the same thing about me. And in fact, I know that it's true. There are places yeah. where he's absolutely convinced me. But in any case, I do believe it's at least, you know, it may not be a totally even fight, but it's, it's more even than some will imagine. Um, but yeah, we have, um, you know, there are things I say that drive him nuts, right? Like when something, you know, like you heard me talk about the, um, what was it? It was the autopilot mm -hmm. that seems to be putting a great many humans in needless medical jeopardy over the COVID-19 pandemic. And my feeling is we can say this almost for sure. Anytime you have the appearance of some captured gigantic entity that is censoring you on YouTube and, you know, handing down dictates from the who and all of that, it is sure that there will be a certain amount of collusion, right? There's going to be some embarrassing emails in some places that are going to reveal some shocking connections. And then there's going to be an awful lot of emergence that didn't involve collusion, right? In which people were doing their little part of a job and something was emergent. And you never know what the admixture is. How much are we looking at actual collusion and how much are we looking at an emergent process. But you should always walk in with the sense that it's gonna be a ratio. And the question is, what is the ratio in this case? I think this drives Eric nuts um, because he is very focused on the people. I think he's focused on the people who have a choice and make the wrong one. And anyway, he made- The discussion of the ratio is a distraction to that. I think, I think he takes it almost as an offense because it grants cover to people who are harming others. And I think I think it, offend, it offends him uh, morally. And if I had to say, I would say it, it uh, alters his judgment on the matter. Um, but anyway, certainly useful just to leave open the two possibilities and say it's a ratio, but we don't know which one. Brother to brother, do you love the guy? Hmm. Hell yeah. Hell yeah, and you know, I'd love him if he was just my brother, but he's also awesome. So I, <laughs> I love him and I love him for who he is. But what do you think is the mind of Einstein's God? Do you think there's a why that we could untangle from this, from this uh, universe of strings? Why are we here? What is the meaning of it all? Well, Steven Weinberg, winner of the Nobel Prize, once said that 
The more we learn about the universe, the more we learn that it's pointless. <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't yeah. profess to understand the great secrets of the universe. However, let me say two things about what the giants of physics have said about this question. Einstein believed in two types of God. One was the God of the Bible, the personal God, the God that answers prayers, walks on water, performs miracles, smites the Philistines. Mm -hmm. That's the personal God that he didn't believe in. He believed in the God of Spinoza, the God of order, simplicity, harmony, beauty. The universe could have been ugly. The universe could have been messy, random, but it's gorgeous. You realize that on a single sheet of paper, we can write down all the known laws of the universe. It's amazing. On one sheet of paper, Einstein's equation is one inch long. String theory is a lot longer, and so is the standard model. But you could put all these equations on one sheet of paper. It didn't have to be that way. It could have been messy. And so Einstein thought of himself as a young boy entering this huge library for the first time being overwhelmed by the simplicity, elegance, and beauty of this library. But all he could do was read the first page of the first volume. <laughs> well, that library is the universe with all sorts of mysterious, magical things that we have yet to find. And then Galileo was asked about this. Galileo said that the purpose of science, the purpose of science is to determine how the heavens go. The purpose of religion is to determine how to go to heaven. So in other words, science is about natural law. And religion is about ethics. How to be a good person, how to go to heaven. As long as we keep these two things apart, we're in great shape. The problem occurs when people from the natural sciences begin to pontificate about ethics and people from religion begin to pontificate about natural law. That's where we get into big trouble. You think they're fundamentally distinct, morality and ethics and our, our idea of what is right and what is wrong. That's something that's outside the reach of string theory and physics. That's right. If you talk to a squirrel about <laughs> what is right and what is wrong, yes. there, there's no reference frame for a squirrel. And realize that aliens from outer space, if they ever come visit us, they'll try to talk to us like we talk to squirrels in the forest, but eventually we get bored talking to the squirrels because they don't talk back to us. Same thing with aliens from outer space. When they come down to Earth, they'll be curious about us to a degree, but after a while they just get bored because we have nothing to offer them. So our sense of right and wrong what does that mean compared to a squirrel's sense of mm. right and wrong? Now, we, of course, do have an ethics that keeps civilizations in line, enriches our life, and makes civilization possible. And I think that's a good thing. But it's not mandated by a law of physics. 